There we go. All right. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Save a Library, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's program entitled Innovative Owners of Small Businesses. Uh, before this pandemic started, the library was very privileged to be the community's meeting hub and host several meetings every single night of the week. Every meeting room was full. Every study room was full. And then the pandemic hit. And uh, the focus that we had all along of get more people into your building, get more people into your building, was the one variable we could no longer have. So uh, we've been through a drastic uh, business model change in moving everything we do online. And uh, this program is one such occurrence. One of the uh, aspects that we are thrilled to still maintain is to have that dialogue with our community. And I've had the great privilege of knowing Dr. Birch, and uh, he and I have been chatting throughout this pandemic about the challenges that our community is facing. And uh, so Dr. Birch brought up to me that one of the communities that has been the hardest hit by a tremendous learning curve from this pandemic is our small business community. And so it was his idea to have an innovative owners of small businesses uh, uh, panel discussion this evening. And we are privileged uh, to have both Dr. Birch and uh, it looks like four different small businesses that are thriving and doing very well with us here this evening. And we have about 17 people uh, in our online uh, meeting room tonight. So welcome to everyone. And on behalf of the library, I'll turn this over to Dr. Birch now and uh, say thank you both to you and to our business owners who joined us this evening. Thank you, Jonathan, very much. Um, I, th I think an important thing to state is this, the purpose of tonight really gets at the heart of the program Jonathan and I set up working together. In a time like COVID, there's a sense of powerlessness. In many circles, there's a sense of despair. Um, what really kind of got this moving was I actually Mark Casabiri approached me and said, you know, James, many years ago, do you remember, you know, I said, do you remember the sable arsonist? And I said, yeah, I mean, I absolutely. He said, you know, I was a, a newer business owner at the time. And, you know, I, it, 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 it bothered me that it was happening to our community and I wanted to do something. He said, you know, I, I, I really kind of, I kind of figured out some ideas afterwards. Uh, but he said, you know, I made a commitment at the time that if we have another problem, another crisis in our community, I'm going to do something. Um, so he approached me and said, James, what can we do to give people some hope uh, to help us be resources to one another? And that really is what sparked um, a series of interviews that we're doing through the library. And this interview is, it's with four business owners who I think have something to teach all of us um, about American entrepreneurialism, but really I think also about the feeling of hope and that as a community, the greater Sable area, there are people here that are skilled, talented, that are a great resource to one another. So that's really what, what drove this. Now, in my own professional life, I'm not a business person. So like, to me, I'm thinking about tonight and I'm thinking, well, I don't know how to dress. So I'm like, this is what you call business casual. Like I, you guys know these things, the four panelists. So I, <laughs> I, I did debate, you know, I wanted to try to find common ground for people. So I thought, what's one thing everybody in terms of dress, and I decided not to go with it, but what's one thing in, in terms of dress where you know, we can really find common ground? And I figured a really good area is politics because all of us agree about politics. So I, I looked through my t-shirt collection for political wear that, you know, to bring people together. And I found my very favorite political shirt. Here we so Dan, go. Dan Ryan, I know I'm recycling this joke, but don't call me out on it. So I found my favorite political t-shirt that we could all agree <laughs> with. Abraham Lincoln, 1860. There we go. But I, I think really though, to me, I'm honored to be here. Um, I, I think I'm grateful for our four business owners mm -hmm. stepping up to offer leadership in this tough time. Um, what I want to do is I'll, I'll share their names. I have a little slide prepared um, because I want to make sure everybody can see them on the screen. Uh, I'm not going to speak to their businesses because we're going to get into that. I want, I want them to speak to that, but I'm honored to have Mark Casabiri, John Keel, Thank you. Frank Palermo, and Dan Ryan. 
Um, but I, before we begin really with our questions, I did invite Eileen Tisner. Um, she had another conflict um, that, you know, she unfortunately a chamber commitment that took her away. Uh, but she asked me to make sure I shared with people um, how honored she was to be here. So I'll blow this up. And you know, let me give me one second, John. I got to shrink it again because I can't see my own screen here. But I told Eileen I'll get it down verbatim because I want to make sure people um, understand good. as our business leader um, locally. She said, you know, she had another another responsibility. Chamber business took away. She's honored to have been asked to be part of the opening of the Zoom presentation. I cannot wait for my interview on June 10th. So she will be interviewed this Wednesday, seven o'clock here. Um, but she said, and it, again, I, I have her statement here. America was built on small business. I'm honored to have been asked to be part of the opening of the Zoom presentation. I cannot wait for my interview on June 10th with the Sable Public Library. The reason for the importance of shopping small businesses because small business is the heart and backbone of America. When you shop local, you keep your local people employed, you improve the value of the area in which you live. These business owners are the people who are involved in your schools, your neighborhood, and sponsoring your local sports and other organizations. It is so important during this time after COVID that we now change the mindset of people shopping big box stores and online and bring them back to our main streets. We needed to reinvent our business plans to sustain this economic hit, which, have some, which some have been successful in trying to do. Many have been able to do so, but as a chamber, we want to support all of those businesses who are trying to come back and trying to recover and reopen. We look forward to the next phases to which we, we can then accompany. So essentially, that is very much, I think, behind the purpose of this panel, is that we want to share the entrepreneurial expertise, the creativity of th four stable business owners. Um, and I think the best way to start really is I really want to turn this question over, and this is the one question I do want each of the panelists to take on. The format will be that we're not going to go in a, in a kind of a static rotation where I pose a question and then we go in order, alphabetical order or anything like that. Well, I will po post a question, and then I'll take it down while, while people answer. But this really is the first question, uh, and I, w I was hoping that each business owner can introduce themselves. Tell us your name, your business, and what markets markets you operate in. So again, please tell us your name, your business, and what markets you operate in. So I'm going to turn it over to the panel. No particular order. <laughs> I'll start. Uh, my name is John Keel. I own and operate WatchGauge.com. Um, watch, I've been in the watch industry, the wristwatch industry, since 1999, end of 99, beginning of 2000. And uh, about three years ago, I launched Watch Cage, which is an online only retail and slash uh, social media company for the wristwatch industry. And my focus is pretty specific. It's, it's a segment of the wristwatch industry called micro brands. And um, I always use the analogy, it's very similar to micro brews. So you have Budweiser, Heineken, Coors, and, and the big brands, and then you've got the micro brews like Blue Point and all the others. And I deal with very small, independently owned uh, watch companies that usually make very small batches of watches. So that's my primary focus and, and my, my reach is global. So, I mean, I, I sell all over the world. Um, I'd say about 70 to 75% of my business is domestic in the United States, but most of it is, is spread out all over the United States and then as well as the rest of the world. Everything that I do is completely 100% online. It's all social media driven, which we'll get into later, I'm sure. But it's, I made that switch seeing a change in my industry, which now is very poignant to what's going on, you know, with all the small businesses, because I took that focus away from what I was doing on, a, on, a, on letting people in through the door and trying to greet them and things like that. And I did it through a virtual world. And uh, knock on wood, thank God, it's been very good. Let me just jump in before we have the next panel. I, I just want to underscore a point. I think when I really, the genesis for this panel really did start with John. Um, we don't know each other super well. We see each other around soccer field, things like that. But I remember talking to John on the drive home. And I was blown away after he just described his business. I drive by his business every day. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, you know, we have this budding entrepreneur 
that's really been very successful. John, where is your, you have some warehouse space? Yeah, so naturally inventorying things like watches, I don't, I don't have a big sign on the door, uh, but I'm on the corner of Oakwood and Montauk, which everybody knows is the building where uh, Sensei Ray has his karate studio. So I'm, uh, yeah. I'm in the backside of that. Yeah. And so I think for me to drive by that all the time and then, you know, actually Dan kind of said that, you know, you know, Keel's very savvy. He's out there. John, again, he pushes out internationally, has a TV studio, actually a small TV studio in his space. Yeah. To me, I drove by that and I realized, wow, what a gem that, that I drive by. I look at the karate kids cause they're cute. <laughs> Not even knowing that, you know, we have this really industrious entrepreneur that's really kind of using a model, pushing it out globally. And he's, you know, lives in Sable. He's got a local business. I, I think I was just, I think that kind of was for the next half of the a ride home. I just was thinking, wow, I just was blown away. I just did not even realize it. I so, have to, I have to be honest. I appreciate it. And um, I wish I could take credit for like, you know, being a, a leader and doing stuff like that, but it was really seriously hundred percent out of necessity. Um, there wasn't a way for me personally to succeed in what I was trying to do unless I took the steps I took. So it was, uh, I, I'm grateful for everything I've learned and done over the last few years. And uh, it's been the most fun three years in the last 20. So that's for sure. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Next panelist. And again, I'm not going to go in order. I, I welcome each of you to just, when you feel comfortable, please just, you know, just introduce yourself, tell us about your business and what markets. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. All right. Great. Dan Ryan, um, project management, project manager by trade. All right. And then in recent years, a project management trainer, coach and author. All right. So there's an old saying, you know, those who can do it and those who can't teach it. Well, I'm only kidding. I could probably, <laughs> I could do it. I could do it pretty good too when I was in my career, but then I can really teach it really extraordinarily. So I became the PM exam coach and I have one singular focus in life. There's a very difficult exam that people need to pass in the world of project management. And when they do, they go from a certain salary to a six figure salary and beyond. And this one small credential is maybe something you might interpret similarly to the CPA exam or the bar exam, or the NCLEX, or the SAT, or the GRE. Anybody, you ever have to prepare for a big test that you knew was a milestone in life? It was something you feared. And so what I do is I found this one world, this one little area where I exist, and everybody was doing project management. So in 2011, when I went through the process of becoming certified, I kept all of my notes and my books and my drives and my PowerPoints. I kept everything. I organized it and I put it into a system to study because nobody out on the internet had put together any kind of study thing that was a turnkey type of a solution. I realized I had developed a turnkey solution without intending to just by putting it together for my own journey. And the guy, I'm working at Estee Lauder up until a year and a half, two years ago, and doing this off the side of my desk, right? Nights and weekends, hustling. And then the guy comes to me and says, dude, you've got a business here. You've helped like 10 people working here past the exam. I said, yeah, I'm just having fun. It's just for fun. He goes, it's not just for fun. Stop saying that. You have a business. So two years ago, I saw a webinar by this woman, Amy Porterfield. She's a famous online course creation content expert. And I signed up for her program and I started to formalize everything that I had been doing informally in my professional career from coaching and mentoring to the documents and presentations. And I put it all into an online bundled platform, renamed myself the PM exam coach and opened a subscription business like Netflix. It's been two years and it's been wonderful. Where are your clients from, Dan? What, what, what markets are you in? I was, John was, as John was talking, I was thinking about, he, I was shaking my head in agreement. <laughs> Literally, I have customers in Zimbabwe and Ghana and uh, New Zealand and Australia and all the way down to Guyana. Oh, you know, every single continent and country on the platform. Um, 
I have about 500 customers currently. It's a subscription. And uh, again, same with John, about 75 to 80% of them are domestic or Canada or US, but a growing market. And it's growing faster than my domestic market. The international market is really growing, especially Asia. Hmm. Well, the way I describe Dan and uh, I'm, Dan is a personal friend for a long time, is that he operates from Bohemia to Bahrain. Uh, which is <laughs> Good one, man. I like that. I like that. All right. So, uh, Mark or Frank, wh whichever one of you is more comfortable, how about it? I'll take it. Uh, Frank Palamo from Close Seafood Market. Um, I'm going to try to keep my story real short and simple. Otherwise, I can go, I could probably go on for an hour and a half. Uh, it started back when I was 12 years old. I wanted a new bicycle. I got a job at a local fish market. I uh, never looked back, you know. Uh, 46 years old now. I um, pretty much have done every aspect of this business in the food uh, industry, along with restaurants. Uh, I was a, a head buyer and the director of all seafood for Pathmark stores for about 18 years. Um, I've worked in fish markets. I've worked on boats. I've worked in manufacturing. I've worked in uh, processing plants in Maryland and uh, a couple places over in Pennsylvania, in, in uh, Philly, uh, a place, uh, Kyler Seafood in Boston. Um, the last job I worked at was uh, NAFCO Seafood in Jessup, Maryland, out of the Jessup Market left a really good paying job to pursue a lifelong dream. And that was in West Sable and opened up my shop. Uh, just before that, I was, I was in charge of, they used to call me the Gordon Ramsay of seafood. I would go into a supermarket or, <laughs> or a fish market and I would tear it apart, uh, make them profitable. And I did that for about five, six years and realized why am I not doing that for myself? Uh, which is why my, my, wonderful wife agreed to uh, kind of give up our life savings and uh, roll the dice. And I'm, I'm blessed that I have. Let me just point one thing out just for people. If most of the listeners, I'm sure are local is clauses that location has been there for many years. Yeah. I, I think it's right on Greens Creek, which is right, right on the West Sable Sable border on Montauk highway. But I think one of the things that kind of helped me understand that we had a, a really hopping entrepreneur in town was just the, the traffic at a, at a clause. And I looked at that like, wow, I don't know who that guy is, but he's doing something right. So Frank, and I, I mean, people have come out of the woodwork, you know, I'm just getting to know you. I know you the least, but I can't tell you that the people that have approached me once they heard you were going to be on this panel. And I think what you add to our community is tremendous. And I'm just immensely grateful you. that you chose our town. You know, Thank you. Thank you. All right, so Mark Cassibiri. Yes, uh, Mark Cassibiri. I'm the founder of At Your Service Staffing. We supply uh, people with great attitudes to catered events and food service companies. So we specifically look for people that are positive, friendly, helpful. Uh, we call a uh, having a service heart. So we're hospitality with a service heart. So that's uh, our company. How the company started was, uh, I can't believe it's over 30 years ago. And... Um, I went to bartending course with my father. I uh, got my bartending degree, I guess. Um, and then I started uh, advertising out in Dan's papers out in the Hamptons and started doing house parties. And I was doing some uh, big events out, out in the Hamptons and I saw these big Greyhound buses uh, ship in these waiters from uh, New York City. Um, and I thought to myself, wow, why are they, you know, sh paying for these buses and the travel time and there's no one here locally in the Hamptons to do that. So that's where the Genesis came from to start up a local uh, Hamptons uh, agency. Um, so what did I do? We, uh, I went through some caterers. I didn't know too much about catering. I said, what are you guys looking for? And of course they, they said, looking for people to smile and attitude, show up on time, the right uniform. So they weren't looking for anything, you know, magical. They just wanted these, these basic uh, tenets of, 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 uh, of business, you know? So, uh, so that's, was the foundation of, of what we uh, worked for, what we built the company on. And from there, we uh, opened up other offices uh, in Manhattan, uh, Boston, DC, Maryland, and Chicago. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Well, one of the things so, that I just wanted to kind of jump in with Mark is 
Mark fills me with immense pride, his business, because, and I'll tell you why, is the largest employer in Sable who has hired generations of people. Uh, and it's because of the scale of the business, but it's Ken Stott. And I feel like kids have done great. Um, and, we, you know, I worked on the, on the freight office. But what I realized is Mark Casabiri has built his business that's operating in multiple cities uh, nationally on great Sable kits. And, and, and when I first realized that I was actually, I don't know, Mark, I don't know if I told you a story, but I was out at, my uncle lived out in Montauk and there was a, an, a, some sort of benefit at the ranch. It's this kind of uh, rustic and I'm out there, whole, I was the babysitter. That's why I got a free ticket. I was in the VIP tent, but it's only because I was the babysitter. So I had my cousin, he's a little kid. And all of a sudden I start seeing all these Sable people around and I'm like, oh, wow. Who are you guys? Like, you know what I mean? And, you know, after I like realized how they got there and it was the Mark's business, I said, can you guys give me a ride home? <laughs> that, was Billy, yeah. that was a Billy Joel concert, I think, at the ranch, right? It was, I don't, it was, uh, I'm not sure, I don't even remember, Mark, but it was some kind of big thing at the ranch. And it, but I think why, again, why your business fills me with pride is, is this creative, successful entrepreneur that has, has gone, you know, basically national. Uh, and it's through kind of care uh, uh, and hospitality. And I think if there's values that make me proud of my, my home, it's that you've built your business on kids that have good attitudes and are helpful and take care of people. I think a little, little well, fun, little fun fact. I actually worked for Mark yes, for a summer. Yes. One of the founding uh, uh, members. Hold <laughs> on, I have to jump in on that too. <laughs> <laughs> I interviewed, I interviewed with Mark. Mark, you had an office next I, to the Catholic church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> God was, used to look up. God was with us in the beginning. I used to <laughs> the house, you had that the house, house there. I lived to in, the, the office was on the second right. floor. Right. So yeah. I walked up these stairs. I was like, I don't know, 21, 22, maybe, 23, young. And it was for a project management job. You had like a junior project manager. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get the job. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> was coming, Dan. What's the no, no, I didn't get the job, but my resume was a mess. I had like spelling errors in my name or something. <laughs> spelling errors in my name. Yeah. <laughs> but so let me funny. let me go to the next uh, to, to really you know and guys you know gentlemen thank you. Like here's here's my question and you might have touched it so on it in the intro but feel free um, to to elaborate a little bit more. So question and it's really about your values of, of your business that you've been able to infuse within your business so pre-covid what parts of your business model and approach best explain your success so again pre-covid uh, what parts of your business model and approach best explain your success i'd like to just jump in on this because uh yeah. and you guys can have the rest because this is important to, to to the success of my company um so just to jump back and I'll be quick about it. So we are talking about the service heart and helping people out and, and volunteering and so forth. So recently uh, we came back on a second trip from Puerto Rico as, as all our management team um, took their weekend, their own time. And we flew to Puerto Rico to work for the world central kitchen for Jose Andres. He's doing a lot of work now feeding America. And also uh, there was earthquake vic victims there and so forth. So we worked on a farm and we worked, distributing food and and it was really great and it was a great like kumbaya moment for our company and we're uh it says a lot about like the team that i have you know matter of fact i gave a little talk to my team that time and i said i just want to freeze frame you guys you know you guys are such there's uh, i it, other entrepreneurs might know there's always one person in the company that you want to be like uh you know that's not the the weakest link you know there were no weak links we had just the great people um, and everyone came back all positive and, 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 and together and our culture was, uh, was, was really strong. And then, um, you know, a month later, this whole thing, is, and we, I had to disassemble that, uh, that, you know, that team. So, so. Mark, when you say your culture and, and I, 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 you know, feel comfortable if you don't want to speak more to that, but what do you mean you say your, your culture of your company? So speak to that a little bit more. It's, uh, it's, um, um, it, it's their, their work ethic, their, their, uh, um, their commitment to teamwork, their, their friendliness. Um, 
and I just go back to work, work ethic. I mean, uh, the, the, our team is just, uh, t to me, second to none as far as uh, just really engaged with our clients. They, they, they listen to the clients and they, they really want to solve their problems and make sure their, their orders are filled. And, you know, it's known in our industry where a lot of people don't show up. So we have extra people booked and they fight. If there's someone missing, that, you know, we have extra people go out and, and it's just a total commitment to, uh, to service really. So. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I would just point out Mark and Frank, you know, in the sense probably have a, you know, a lot more of a mature business model in some ways because they deal with that in-person traffic every day. I don't know, maybe me and John would have a graciousness of having this online business where, we get to sit behind the screen and hide in the basement 24 hours a day. But I have a lot of respect for Mark and Frank, that servant leadership that Mark is describing and, 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 and taking care of all of his customers. And that was by design, the panel, like, you know, we started talking about this and we had some commitments. I thought it would be helpful to the community if we had like say two virtual businesses and then two people that were kind of in-person businesses. Because in reality is that not every business can be a virtual business. You're not going to be in hospitality or, um, you know, selling locally like, like Frank's doing. Um, online, it, it's, you know, it's a different type of business. It's, we will always have brick and mortar. Uh, the, the, I think the point is, though, to, to learn what we can from both mediums. Uh, but you don't, realize, you don't realize how much you miss your customers until you have a worldwide pandemic. It's true. You don't get to see them. You know, I, I, you're not going to complain about that one customer anymore. No, no. You know, I, I, I take for granted all the people, the, you know, 11, 1200, 1800 people that come in every, every week. And, you know, it's a hello, Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so. And how are the kids or how are this? And I, I mean, I, I, the town is amazing. I mean, the people are amazing. They, they, it's such a small tight knit town where, you know, over the last eight, nine years that I've been there, you, you just know people's lives and their families. And, um, you know, sometimes people like to talk a little too much, you know, let's, <laughs> but, uh, uh, now I, I miss it. I miss, you know, the customers that love to talk and hang out, have a cup of coffee. Um, you know, it's been, it's been a couple of months and, uh, I miss them. I miss them immensely. So Frank, what, like kind of speak a little bit to the, to the question. Um, what parts of your business model and your approach do you think helped you be successful? Like, because clearly you're, you're, you're doing great and we're this, proud of you. This is pre pre COVID. Pre. Um, it was really a mission of mine. You know, I, I, there's, I know we were kind of talking about beer, uh, about a half an hour ago. And there's, there's, there's two types of beer, you know, the, 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 the Budweiser's and your micro brews, you know, and, and, um, to me, I, I'm not a big beer drinker, um, but I'm a big Scotch drinker. I love I love a good quality Scotch, right? So to me, I'm gonna I'm gonna spend the extra twenty thirty dollars a bottle and get a really good tasting Scotch. Um, with seafood, it's the same exact thing. Well, I guess with anything, you know, there's there's your um, tilapia, there's your uh, bassa or swai. There's your regular Canadian salmon, all of which could be chemically treated, uh, tasteless, but very inexpensive. Or you can get yourself a nice Scottish salmon, or you can get yourself a nice hand-cut local flounder that's never seen any type of chemical, uh, and a dry scallop where it's never been processed. And there's, there's obviously a price increase for that, but since the town of Sable and West Sable and Oakdale are very nautical people, they're very, you know, the people in that town or, or those couple of towns know their food. And knowing that going in and knowing that there's two different types of seafood out there, I knew day one, those folks wanted the real deal. I know those folks were tired of what I was selling back then was a supermarket type seafood, a tilapia which is probably three to four ninety nine a pound right now. And I don't even carry that in the store because everything I carry in the store is uh, chem free. Mm. So by doing that, there's going to be an increase in cost and it could be substantial. Let's take tuna, for example, you can get a, 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 a chemically treated tuna 
that looks like a neon red that's almost unnatural for about eight to nine dollars a pound in the supermarket or Costco or anywhere. When you take it home, it's just going to taste bland. It's not going to taste like anything, you know. But the, the, the shelf life on that tuna is about a week and a half. Or let me offer the customer the best of the best, a $26 a pound sushi grade ahi tuna where it has a shelf life of two days. Mm. And there's not much of a margin in that, but I felt that if I'm going to go one way, I'm going to do it all. I'm going to be, I'm going to be all in. And that's exactly what I did. I made that promise to myself, to my family, to my customers that I am never going to sell tilapia. I'm never going to sell anything that's chemically treated and everything that comes into that door is going to be the highest quality you could possibly get. And well, I mean, I, I'm not ashamed to admit this, but the first two years of business, I made nothing. I was under pre-foreclosure, my own house. I took everything and threw it into that store, knowing that the customer base would be there. And oh my God, they came in droves. And then over the years, and you know, obviously I'm out of pre-foreclosure now, um, and I'm doing much better. Uh, but that was, that was probably the biggest gamble of my life was just taking that, you know, that, mm -hmm. that risk of not carrying junk and only carrying the highest quality that, that alone, that was, that was the main focus of, of how we, how we grew that, of course there's, you know, customer interaction and, and, you know, and, you know, knowing what your best customer gets every day and, you know, that that one on one personal uh, 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 interaction, um, making sure all, all of my associates understand and, you know, also um, creating that family atmosphere within the people that work for me. You know, I've got I've got three girls that have been through the cycle already, which I'm extremely proud of. And one of them is now a nurse and two are now doctors. Um, and they make good money there, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a great job. And, and I'm very proud that we have a, such a tight knit group of girls and guys that work there and they don't leave, they stay, you know, which is great. And that's that same culture that Mark was talking about too. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, John, you have some thoughts? Like, what do you think explains it? And you don't, you don't have to, like, if you want to take another question. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it's really kind of strange. I, I was in traditional retail for 15 or 16 years and I ran a very high end jewelry and watch operation for, for many, many years I ran it. And I saw, I saw that business model not changing and the business or the, or the world around it changing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we would, we would go days on end or, or a day or two without a single customer walking in. And we had $5 million worth of inventory, mm -hmm. you know, jewelry and watches and so on. And I started to just feel like, I, I, I would hate to say I felt like I was on a sinking ship, but I felt like I was on a ship that was taking on water very slowly and nobody was really figuring out how to bail us out. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I'm super blessed with an unbelievably supportive wife. And, and I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit. And she said, do it. She said, just start your own thing. And I actually, the business model that I built, a lot of people are now who are in, or were in my industry, running a jewelry store, a watch store. I've gotten so many phone calls over the last two or three months saying, well, John, I've, I've got this store. I'm not allowed to open or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on limited hours or one client at a time. How do I, how do I start my YouTube channel and my Instagram to get business? And I said, it, it doesn't work that way. It, social media takes literally years, years to get a big following. And I'll, I'll never forget when I started this, I knew it was going to be hundred percent social media. I had never, ever been on video before. And I mean, so much just, uh, like when people are walking around at Christmas time with their video cameras, I'd be the guy walking away. <laughs> and, um, and I knew that I had to start a YouTube channel and I, I had no idea how to do it. So I spent hours at night watching YouTube videos on how to shoot a YouTube video, how to edit a YouTube video, um, on how to create an Instagram page that's geared towards your business and to build it, you know, and things like that. So it's kind of the things that I did three years ago and two years ago over the last three years, 
are things that a lot of businesses now are going, well, gee, I really wish I had been doing that because I can't open my doors the way I used to do it. And if I had that interaction virtually online, you know, they could be doing business. And it's, there's two or three real high end watch stores in the United States that used to be what the same as I was doing who have embraced that. And I've, I speak to the guys who own those stores and their, their business has never been better and they haven't been able to open the doors for three months hmm. because they've got the YouTube, the Instagram, the Facebook, and you know, and they reach out to their customers through email marketing. So it's kind of strange because my business hasn't really changed a whole lot because of the COVID thing. Mm-hmm. But what I've been doing for the last three years is kind of the perfect example of why maybe other businesses should be looking at other, other directions. One thing I just want to make a point, give a little prop, props to a business owner in town. Uh, the Stop and Shop in Sable. Every, I mean, mo- I think most of us are familiar with that Stop and Shop. If, if you look slightly to the east of that building, there's an auto parts store. Uh, nice guy. If I need a headlight, that's where I am. And it's interesting. I went there one time and I remember he was like closed for like an hour. And I was like, you know, it's cool, whatever. I need to go shopping. I went shopping. I go back. I said, you're closed for an hour every day. He goes, yeah, I got to go deliver my online. And I said, you got to go deliver your online. I'm like, what do you mean you're online? He goes, yeah. He said, you know, many years ago, people can purchase my products online. He said, I'd say, I don't know what percent of his business is online, but he's operating. He said, I don't think I would be in business if I hadn't pushed out online. And I, I, my instinct might be that at least half his business is online. Um, I can't remember specifically. So like, the, you know, it's interesting. We have two panelists that are purely online, two panelists that are purely in person. Uh, but I, I think there's definitely, and, and you spoke to that, John, like that with those watch manufacturers that they're operating blended models. So I just think it's, you know, if I had, that's kind of an interesting lesson just to think about, but let me turn to the next question because um, I want to kind of start digging into the heart and soul of, um, what we're dealing with right now as a community. So question. So people fear change. It's different for business. If you don't adapt, you fail. What changes have you made or are you making now to adapt to the shutdown? And I'll repeat that. People fear change. It's different for businesses. If you don't adapt, you fail. What changes have you made or are you making now to adapt to the shutdown? I'll jump in on that. But I'm going to do what the politicians do and first back up and get the question that I didn't get to answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I told you guys earlier, I embraced Mark's idea of servant leadership. I went out, I figured out, okay, project management's where I want to be. Then I went down a niche. I found the testing angle. Then I went down deeper. Nobody's making the testing simple. I'm going to make it simple. So I did like Frank did. He knew Sable was ripe for those products and those customers would appreciate it. He knew the legacy, the DNA of the area. I knew my customers were hungry for a turnkey solution. So, you know, that's the the pre-COVID what helped me. Now, when you say people fear fear change, I would say that I fear change as a business owner. I fear it more than before I owned a business. Hmm. But the difference is I just don't, now I just realized no one's gonna help me fix it. Hmm. It's only gonna be me that fixes it. Otherwise the business is just not going to be a business anymore. That's all. So what I decided to do was shift my paradigm and I did a brainstorming session on how is my customer being affected? Forget about me and what I think I should sell or how much or what, what's going on in my customer's head. Right? So like Frank, I reached out to my customers and I asked them, I surveyed 150 people. I met and talked to 50 of them. I probably spent 10 hours just listening and 90, I swear to God, 99.9% of the people all said the same thing. We don't have the time. We have no time. I have no time. Wife, marriage, kids, family, this and that. I have no time. Not everybody has as supportive as a wife as I do. And I'm not just saying that because she's listening. (laughs) All right. But, um, (laughs) They had no time. So what did I do? I made everything in five minute lessons, easily digestible. There's an app for the phone. I'll hold classes on weekends. I'll hold them at night at nine o'clock at night. I was holding classes. So now I said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna hold classes seven days a week. I'm gonna go live seven days a week at 12 o'clock, 365 days a year. I'm working every day of the year, at least one hour. 
and I put the invite out there on Zoom and we're having this Zoom call here, I could get 50 or 75 people on my daily Zoom calls. And, I, and, and they love it. They feel that connection. They were, they were like Frank. They were at home, disconnected, afraid, scared, lonely. They were telling me all these emotions they were having, depressed. And so, you know, I served them by giving them this extra value, but not by charging anything extra for it. That's how I gave back. And so, yeah, change is scary, but nobody's going to help you. And so think about who you serve and then make the change to serve them better. And then you get rewarded. So are you seeing that, Dan, just to kind of speak a little bit more, like you, we're dealing with the shutdown. So is your business, um, it, are there any modifications, adjustments? That you I mean, need? I have been doing the whole virtual learning thing since 2011. Okay. So now everybody's trying to pop up an online business all of a sudden. They're like, Dan, how do I do that? It's like John says. They think, oh, yeah, dude, I got to start using Facebook. How do we make money with that? It's like, oh, yeah, you just need 10,000 followers. <laughs> yeah. That should only take a few days. Now, I don't even use any social media. You might find it interesting. John has a very successful social media juggernaut. Frank has everybody coming in in person. I don't use social media. My strategy is different. I make an army of free things, an army of free things workbooks, videos, slides, YouTubes, PowerPoints, you name it, anything I can think of. And I put them in as free products and I sprinkle them to the winds of the internet. Okay. People come and grab them and love those freebies. Give me freebies. And then all those emails go into my database. And these are people who like my stuff because they're taking my free stuff. And then I come along and say, how would you like something for five bucks? Hey, five bucks, not bad. We call that a tripwire, right? <laughs> a low cost product that nobody can resist. Then they come into the tripwire and then that the online funnel <laughs> starts and we start bringing them down the funnel to a fully subscribed member. Nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. And, and I figured it out. It took me like three years to figure the funnels out, how to bring people in, how to engage them, how to ascend them, how to get them loving me. And then how to break out. Well, I love you, Dan. So thanks. How to break out those 16 digits of love at the end of all of that. <laughs> right, so some other guys, please feel free. Um, so now, what changes have you made now? Have you made or are you making now to adapt to the shutdown? So I'll just jump in here as far as uh, not even I, I'll talk about my changes. But one thing I initially went through was uh, the so-called pivot, which. Uh, I call it like a panic pivot. Some companies in my work for them, but uh, companies in me look to like pivot into something totally brand new, perhaps un unrelated to what they were doing. So I spent some time looking at various pivots and I was like, it just doesn't, doesn't feel right. Uh, and then we came to a point where we're not really looking to pivot. We don't want to lose our core, you know, sending out great people that are friendly and helpful and, and hot into hospitality service. Or, so we, uh, we looked into like an evolution. We wanted to, to evolve our, our services. So even though our hospitality business is basically really, really, you know, uh, on the lower, uh, you know, point of, of really the 30 years, to be honest. So we, we uh, evolved into uh, still doing food service staffing, but in hospitals. And we did more of, uh, instead of having the fancy cater waiter at the Hampton Classic, uh, now that cater waiter might be, uh, going into uh, a hospital in, in New York City to help uh, to clean it, you know, and so forth, or uh, or to do the dishes there and stuff like that. So we kind of kept, we just evolved. We're evolving our company as opposed to uh, the, the pivot. Hey, Mark, what about any government contracts? Yes. Yeah, so we, uh, great. Yeah. So we, um, our DC office, we do a lot of work with uh, the United States Senate and the World Bank and and so forth. Um, but uh, to be honest, that's more through a food service company. We don't do directly with the with the government. So I'm open to, that's a whole nother world as far as uh, government contracts. You got to really uh, know what you're doing and get your bids together and not something that we really do. We do more uh, personal selling one-on-one -on -one each account. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good idea. Cool, thank you. John and Frank, what are your thoughts? What, what, what changes have you made or are you making to deal with the shutdown? I'm still making them. I said I'm still I'm still making changes. Yeah. Cool. You hear me? Yeah, you're good. It's, um, it's been a uh, oh, it's been a headache. It's been it's been a work in progress since day one. 
you know, um, when the pandemic first started, um, we really didn't know what was going on. You know, um, there was there was some uncertainty in the area. There was uh, things going on in Italy and not really here in the U.S. And um, we kind of jumped the gun a little bit um, to where we then, if I can remember, we were just letting one customer in at a, you know at a time and. Uh, I still had my whole staff, um, and it wasn't, it didn't really hit me until both of my cooks, whose mothers are nurses, came down with COVID. They're, they're, they're fine, um, but it scared the hell out of me, you know? And I'm like, oh my God, that's right here. Um, so I had let them, ho- I, I let them go home until I kind of knew they were quarantined for two weeks, or again, it seems like a year ago, but it was only a couple months ago. Um, that, that's when I had the team meeting and I, I, I sat with everybody and said, uh, we, we've got to make some changes here because number one, um, this is looking pretty scary. Number two, um, uh, I've got a business I've got to run and I've got to do it in the safest way possible. You know, um, uh, I actually love change. I, 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 I would change my business model tomorrow. Uh, I would change it, uh, uh, 10 times a month if I could. Um, and we changed things around. Once things really hit the fan, um, we started to, we actually ended up closing the, the door. Um, I'm set up at my store. Um, it's almost like I was set up for a pandemic. I've got two outside windows out front that we use for okay. takeout and for ordering for mm-hmm. cooked foods. Um, So I didn't have to do anything structurally to the building to set it up. Like I've just noticed today that La Tavola down the block from us um, is putting in a big um, uh, deck around the entire uh, uh, shop so he can have uh, um, outside dining come the 15th, which is great. I didn't have to build anything. I didn't have to put any money into it. Um, I just... I didn't know what to do. So we had a couple of things that we tried that did fail, you know, and um, with every hundred failures, you always find one that's a home run, you know? Um, so what we did was we went straight to phone, you know, and the phone wouldn't stop ringing. And I, I could only service a handful of customers a day. And that's just not going to pay the bills. And all of this kind of happened in the springtime where I'm really not that busy. Uh, but I was taking, I was taking on water as well, too. We were, I mean, our first week of the pandemic, I think we were down 84% over last year, which is huge. Um, so, okay, immediately that, that plan's got to change. I've got to adapt. I got to come up with something better. Um, things were getting worse with the pandemic. So I actually sent all my employees home, uh, kept paying them, but I just sent them home. I says, until we can figure this out, let's just just go home, enjoy, and just be safe. Um, and I, I, I only had myself, my wife, my three kids working in the store. My thought process was that if they were living with me and we're all healthy, we can all work together too. And that was, uh, that was a little bit of a pain in the rear end because I still have three kids that are technically in school. So I've got them in the back of my office taking a test while I've got a customer that we're trying to help. And it was just a big family juggling act. It was, it was just crazy. Uh, the phones, I instantly ripped out of the wall. We haven't answered the phones in three months. We just can't, you know, it's just too much. Um, so I ended up doing a, a, a cycle system where the customer can enter inside of the tent one at a time, place their order. And that's when I realized I've got to take more advantage of Facebook. Now, Facebook has been a huge uh, advertising tool for us for the past five years. My customer base is only Facebook, uh, only because they're an older crowd uh, where the younger kids are more into the Instagram and Snapchat and uh, any other ones I don't even know. Um, but Facebook is where, is where my, my business thrives. I think we started the pandemic with like 6,000 followers. I think we're at 10,000 now. It's just it's just grown into this huge thing. And I think there's only 5,000 people in West Sable, you know? Yeah, so, you're right. Um, yeah. So, so uh, um, it, 
it taught me how impactful social media could be, where now I post an offerings list every morning of, mm. of stuff I carry um, to the world, where normally I would never do that because my competitors can see how much I'm charging for things, but I really don't care. I, I, I just want them to know you can come in and get this variety because they can't see anything now. Right. They have to just come to the window, order off of really an Excel spreadsheet and hope where that that's where trust comes in. Hope yeah. that they're getting exactly what they want and it's the freshest product available. So uh, I didn't know if that was going to work. Well, it did. And, and it, 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 it just took off. Um, and then the, I mean, the last change I had was that we just kind of turned into a mini mart and, and mm -hmm. I can't take credit for that because honestly, that was, that was a little old lady that was scared to come out. And she had a, a I think she had open heart surgery, had a, a, a massive immune issue thing going on and said, uh, you know, I, I love you guys and I've been shopping there for seven years, but I can't be around people right now. And I, I, I totally get it. And that, that's really when I said, well, what do you need? Well, I, I, need, I need eggs and I need milk. I need my sour cream. I, you know, I need this, I need bread. And coming from the supermarket industry, uh, I'm like, well, I, I can buy bread. I could sell bread. I could sell, I mean, I'm licensed. I have a food handler's license. I could sell whatever. I, I could even sell beer. Um, so there, there is an investment there because, you know, if you're, if, if you're buying um, strip steaks or boneless ribeyes, they're, they're not cheap, you know, so it's a, a thousand dollar investment on one item. Um, but, but I thought I could, I could sell it. Why not? You know, and I did. And then we had 250 plus items on this daily menu and people were coming in and dropping off their list at the window and coming back in an hour. And, you know, it's four or $500 in groceries every, every you know, sometimes twice a week because everybody was eating home now and nobody can go out and, our business just absolutely took off. And it was those little tiny items too that you really didn't, I, I would never think about buying a, a, a yeast, um, a, a white a, a bread flour. Uh, I think uh, the first three weeks of doing this grocery store item assortment, we, I, 17 50 pound bags of flour that week. Like, really? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm not. I'm not a baker, but that's yeah. a lot of flour. You know what I'm saying? Well, well I used the fish store. <laughs> we searched everywhere for yeast for months. We couldn't find it. We finally <laughs> bought a pound. We got a one pound box shipped. Yeah. I, I it, you know, just a quick funny story. Like, you know, I, Facebook was when people would come on and said, I didn't know you have yeast. Can you get me bread flour? And I, I'll be honest with you. I didn't know what bread flour was. I just thought it was all <laughs> flour. So I, I'm buying these 50 pound stacks of bread flour and I look like Pablo Escobar in the back of my store with these bags <laughs> and the flour. And I had two kilo bags of flour offering them to customers for like four or five bucks. There's no gross in flour, I'll tell you right now. But it was just that other item that they needed that maybe if they came and bought a pound of string beans, they would buy a tuna steak or a pound of mm. salmon or, you know, some shrimp. Um, it's a lot of work, the, you know, the grocery business at a very low gross, but it kept our numbers up. It kept the, you know, the bills paid and it kept me uh, from laying off anybody, which was me. I mean, that was, that was extremely important to me. I had to keep paying my, my associates, but that, I mean, that was, I, I, I can go, go on for an, another three hours just talking about changes and how we've kind of evolved. And we're changing every day now. Like I know that, that the, the outside dining is now allowed on the 15th, but um, we're taking it very slow. I, I, I'm very worried about what uh, my customers think because yeah. they, they are, they're the reason that I'm in business and their major concern was we just want to be safe. We will keep coming to you. Just don't, don't overdo it. Keep doing what you're doing. And you guys have probably seen all these posts that I put up there. And I try not to put too much out there, but they, they, they tell me what they want. And, and I, I give it to them, you know. Let me just make three very brief points about Frank specifically. 
Uh, the first is we're doing this today because Frank was anticipating uh, phase two open. He said, James, you know, honestly, and, and it was you know, very polite, respectful, saying, you know, it might make sense to do it um, before this phase two, uh, because kind of get people thinking about it and thinking about safety, getting business owners thinking about it. So like this calendar date has very much to do with Frank. Um, the second observation is, I don't know if you guys have been in close. I, I, I'll be honest with you, Frank, I haven't shopped there much, but I'm going to now after talking to you and hearing you here. But I, I think what, while waiting to just kind of leave a message for Frank, I was blown away. Like I felt like you trained your customers. Like, and I work in a school, it's, it's a behavior management program. So it's, it's, we have a system with points and rewards and very specific protocols. And I, I thought like, it was like choreographed. You go up here, you put your money here, you give your order. And there was no confusion, frustration, anger. Everybody knew like the layout and, and yeah. how, and it, I just couldn't stop. I was just blown away by it. wasn't it. like that in the beginning. I'm sure. But you it was, it was everybody. <laughs> but I think in my last observation, John, I want to definitely let you take a crack at it. I think one of the things, and I see it very much uh, also with Mark's business, is um, there's, there's a hosp hospitableness about your approach to business. Like you told me a story of the lady, she wanted a glazed ham. He's like, what do I know about glazed ham? But you're not telling customers what they want. You're letting them tell you what, what they want. Yeah. And I think there's a lesson in that and just being – receptive and really listening uh, to what the customer's needs are that I think get, gets at the heart of real good business. It's about serving. It's that same thing you, point you made, Dan, but it's that hospitality and being open to, to people's needs and those needs change like we saw with the shutdown. But again, you know, Frank is the newest person to me, but it's why we're doing this now. And it's just for me, I think kind of epitomizes the way to handle this, this crisis is just continue to serve people, help them support them and make sure that everybody's safe. Like to me, I, you know, I'm just grateful to have you, Frank, and everybody on this panel, but you kind of epitomized to me when I spoke to you, really the approach that we need to embrace to deal with this crisis and the shutdown. But John, I, I'm sorry, I talked oh. a little too much. No, not at all. You know, it's, it's kind of funny because this whole COVID thing has forced me to do things a little bit less out of necessity, like in, let's say, Frank's case or Mark's case, right? Because they're, they're, really impacted um my my sales were you know november december i always i always dip because i sell a product that mostly men buy and they buy for themselves so in november december they're buying gifts for their wives and their kids and you know so they don't really go and spend a thousand dollars on a watch for themselves but usually in january i get a massive bump and then february and it just it works from there and january came along this year and i think that's when really it was kind of starting to break worldwide right and you started hearing news stories about it and there's a lot of you know there's a lot of fear a lot of um you know what what is this actually going to mean and then you turn one news channel on and the world's ending another channel saying don't worry it's just a, it's a flu um so i think what it was for for my business is that there was a lot of uncertainty with i guess my consumer base or the the type of people that would be buying a luxury item again I'm not selling something that somebody can use on a daily basis as, or something they need on a daily basis. If somebody's buying something from me, it's because they want to treat themselves. It's like that. It's that one gift to themselves that they want to hide from their wife. You know what I mean? Like I've, I've actually, I've actually had clients who said, listen, I'll give you an extra 50 bucks. If you send me a fake receipt, you know, that says it was a hundred dollar <laughs> watch. Um, so January came along and I was down, I, I was down probably about 60% from last January. And then February came along and I was down about 70% from last February. Hmm. And I actually started to panic because I'm really a pretty new business and I've got a lot of money tied up in inventory and I don't have a ton of working capital. And I started to really kind of get nervous. So I started talking to some of the brands I deal with. Cause again, the brands I sell, most of them are guys just like me. They, they started their business out of passion. They're true startups. They're not, they're not funded by anybody and they're, they're in very similar situations to me. So we started saying, gee, what, what can we do? I mean, how do we, how do we take what we have, know what's going on around the world and somehow give ourselves a bump? So we kind of did a few things. I mean, I did some things with one brand. I did some things with another brand. And one of the things is, is that I sell online a 
luxury item that people don't need and it's a gift for themselves, right? And they might be spending a lot of money on it, maybe $1,000, $1,500 or $800 or whatever it may be. So we kind of, one of my friends and I, one of the brands and I said, look, what can we do to kind of give people just a little bit more excitement about doing this for themselves and this kind of need and things like that. We came up with like a 60 day return. No, I'm sorry. A six month return policy and a six year warranty on the product. Just because nobody in the industry has that, not Rolex or Cartier or not Tag Heuer and not um, any micro brand. We said, look, you can return it five months down the road. As long as it's in the condition you got it in, not beat up and worn, you can return it in six months. And then on top of that, we have a six year warranty. The longest warranties in the industry are two years. Hmm. But God forbid somebody returns an $800 watch four years down the road because it's not operating operating correctly. And it's going to cost me a hundred dollars to get it fixed. I mean, it, it just totally made sense. And people, it, it made a buzz. It made like a ra- crazy buzz in the industry. So we just started to do things that were just like, what's really outrageous. What, what, what would make people think these guys are either really smart or really stupid. And, um, you know, what else? There's just, there's so many little things I've done. I got, I got very comfortable before this COVID thing. I got to the point where I was rolling in at 10 o'clock. I play some pinball in the back as I, you know, I throw some darts in the back with another friend or Dan would come by and we'd sit and talk for an hour and I got really comfortable. And this whole thing has made me realize that I can't get comfortable. I, I have to, I have to be in my office at 10 o'clock at night again, doing another video for Facebook or doing an interview for another channel or something like that. Just getting my face out there. Um, I also started reaching out to YouTubers in the watch industry more. So there's one YouTuber that I became friendly with. He's got 70 or 80,000 subscribers. He puts a video up at 10 o'clock in the morning by five in the afternoon, 20,000 people watch this video. And I say, look, I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you this watch, right? You do a review on it. And then after your review is done, give this watch away to one of your guys. We'll collect emails. So we just got it really creative with how we can do things. I, I, I've collected my, my email list, I think was about maybe 10,000 people strong in December. And I think I'm up to about 35,000 emails now wow. because I got scared. I got scared into, you know, this can happen and I can lose this business and I can go have to go back to work 70 hours a week for somebody else. Ah. And that was terrifying to me because I love my life right now. Ah. So that's the kind of things we do. And last week I had, I, I was very, very busy for two or three or four days. And then I had like two or three days where, uh, you know, I wasn't busy at all. So I took that 27,000 email list and I put together a fun little creative email. It's like, Hey, look at me, come look at these watches. And I think I, I, you know, my, if, if I'm just going to make up numbers here, if my daily sales average is a thousand, you know, I sent that email and I'm, I did 8,000 that day, you know? So, um, as bad as this whole situation has been for so many people, uh, both physically and health wise and people dying and people losing their business, I sort of look back and say, well, gee, I, I, I think it was kind of good for me because it put a real scare into me and it made me realize that what I do, I can't just sit back and say, okay, I'm making a, you know, I'm making a better living than I was three years ago. So, you know, I could sit back and hang out and do nothing. Now it's, it's kind of, it's given me a, a stronger drive again. One of the things, John, and, and, and you know, I, I don't, we didn't speak about this earlier, but Dan had mentioned to me, he said, you know, he was just talking about, I said, how's it going with your business? I, I always, I'm just curious. I want to learn. And he told me that, you know, he goes, that John completely like reimaged his, his model and how he operates that, you know, he was looking at his month to month from year to year, wasn't seeing what he wanted. And they just made these at, I think what you're saying, the, the processes you're describing, the changes, the experimentation, your willingness to risk failure as, failure as part of learning, that is a lesson unto itself for our businesses. Yeah. So you, you brought your sales back up, you, you doubled down, but you also got creative. Oh, and I'm also hearing that he learned that his business is like a beautiful flower. <laughs> and you you need to sprinkle water on it and take the little dead pieces off and take care of it. It's not just going to take care of itself. One million percent. And I got I have to say, January and February were the two worst months since the day I started this business. March was fantastic, April's fantastic, May was fantastic. June is so far easily the best month I've had since I started this business. That's, wow. awesome. That's awesome. And it's 
I, I tell you, again, I, I was so, so scared. Cool. I was so afraid. The big thing for me, too, is that I'm very – I am my business, so I'm, I'm the YouTube channel. I'm the Instagram. I'm the guy doing the interviews. And I do it to the point where it's like – and it sounds really cheesy, but I'll go to a watch show – in, uh, you know, in, in California or Washington, D.C., and people are coming over and be like, oh, can I get a picture with you, which is really strange. Um, <laughs> it's, it's like, oh, you're John, you're on the YouTube, oh, you, you know, and it's really strange. And to it, and any business owner will tell you, you're terrified of failure, right? But then all of a sudden, I'm like, well, holy crap. So, so, like the whole world is going to know I failed. It's not just <laughs> going to be like the people in my town and my family. It's going to be people like I can't even go into this industry again because I'm going to be like the guy who failed, you know. That's true. I got to say, I have a deep fear of people rallying against my brand online. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Like this guy's is like, you know, you go online to Google reviews, right? And what you see, scam, total scam, don't go there. Like, and I'm always like checking my Google reviews. I'm all four stars, five stars, but I'm just waiting for that first one. Oh, but you're also, Dan, you're looking at feedback and that you're kind of setting up my next question. But Dan, think about it. You're, take, you're looking at people's feedback of you, which I think is vital to growth. But that kind of flows into the next question, which is, you know, our economy. And this is a, a question that was easy to make because it gets at my biggest thought about our local businesses in Sable. And I'll speak a little, before I read the question. Um, Sable, our identity, our future is tied to two things. And I think we all know that what they are. The first is the water and tourism and Fire Island. But the second is our town is charming. And it has an appeal to people, a Victorian appeal to people. And a mom and pop shop, I think that kind of speaks to Eileen's point. Um, you know, about, you know, the backbone of businesses, the mom and pops, those are our neighbors. They sponsor our, our little leagues. But here they are competing and John, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to fail on a global stage, but, you know, you know, I'm thinking about those business owners a lot because I want my kids to grow up in the stable I grew up in where these people own these businesses and contribute. So the question is, is our economy is more global than ever. Amazon, inexpensive Walmart goods and cheaper services flood the market. This makes it challenging for brick and mortar businesses who pass on costs to customers in the form of higher priced goods. How have you dealt with this reality in your business? In other words, how have you dealt with globalism with such fierce competition? You know, I'll tell you that the simple, I was thinking about this a little bit and I think the simple answer is if Amazon has perfected selling books, don't open a bookstore in Sayville, right? If Netflix has mastered online film delivery, don't open a blockbuster. <laughs> All right, we need to come up with Jewett engine and maybe the guy Frank needs to get an app called Claws app so that, right? We need to embrace the technology and find the groups that still need to be served. So what I would say is like as for dealing with wholesalers like Amazon, I, I took my, I bought a bunch of products here for my customers to send them and I used Amazon and Alibaba and those people and I got a hundred textbooks custom with my stuff in it to send to my customers for seven bucks each from Alibaba. And that's part of a $500 sale that I'll make. And did, did Alibaba make out? They made out. Did I make out? I made out, but my customer made out most of all. Hmm. So just flip the script. Don't come in there and try to do some tired old strategy that the big guys have already mastered and use some of their stuff to make money for yourself. Cool. Thanks. Correct. Yeah. Great. So, anybody else? Frank, John. I don't. I don't think. Um, I don't think that question would really pertain to me, only because it's such a. Um, you know, my business is a really a dying breed. Um, hmm. There's not many fishmongers around that uh, that can fillet or steak or. Well, you know, Frank. Whole Foods sends me some very beautiful fish with Amazon, oh, yeah. with with Fresh Food Direct. Yeah, just saying. Good. good for what, them. Are you gonna, what are you going to do to compete with them? Uh, I, I'm not. Um, if if there was an opportunity for me, and and, and I've, I've I've looked at it to where I could do a mail order. Um, I I like to grow within my community rather than nationwide um 
I tried online stuff before. It um, it was too much for us. Um, I I would need a much bigger place as well. Um, I I'm more I'm more into the brick and mortar. Focus yep. on what you're really good at, and that's yep. just me. Um, like for example, we just in this pandemic there was another opportunity for me. Um, I was approached by the Oakdale Yacht Club, and we just took over all their all their food and their food trucks. So we just started that last week. Um, I, I don't plan on seeing a return on that until we can technically have live music over there. Hmm. Um, but I I didn't plan on it, but I'm actually profitable now after two weeks. So thank God for that. Um, but I'm also looking to open up um, more along the lines of a chain of fry shops across Long Island. It's always been just, uh, you know, in the back of my head, I know it's very profitable. I know it's easy. I don't have to be there constantly to where if I opened up uh, another fish market, say, and, and, and actually I did uh, about four years ago, I opened up another shop in uh, St. James. That only lasted two years because it, 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 it needs that, it needs that personality trait. It needs that one-on-one -on -one with the customer. It's, it's, it's a 100% mom and pop shop. What I, have at Claws. Um, and if I'm not there, it, it as great as, as much as I love my crew and they're the best people in the world, you know, when the cat's away, the mice will play, you know what I mean? And, and, you know, business will deteriorate over time unless the owner or the wife is there, uh, making sure things are done correctly. So for, you know, the whole foods of the world and the mail order stuff, it's really not my business. Um, I, I, to me, I would impact that with opening other locations within other communities and really putting the recipe that I've created at Claws and putting that in other, other towns as well. That, that's how I would, I would impact that. Let me speak very briefly. And John, I definitely, Mark, I want to hear from you too. Is I, I don't want the question to suggest um, that in some ways I value an online model or I think your adherence to quality and to identifying a specific market where there was an appreciation of quality, quality uh, I think speaks to your business acumen. Um, yeah. I think, you know, and, and you are flying in the face of the globalism because you're offering a high quality product fresh to people that really appreciate it and are willing to pay for it. Um, so I, I, I don't want to somehow with the question creates some sort of like, like, wow, I love the internet. I, I think it's, you know, you, you, you have the experience and you made a very, you know, good decision and you put it all on the line. Um, so I, I don't want to, to in any way devalue. I think what you've done and for our community, um, you've enhanced us. So I, I don't want that question to in any way create an impression of like, you know, I don't think online is the end of the deal, but it's fierce. So like, so John and Mark, you know, please feel free is how have you dealt with, you know, global competition in, in your own business and in, in your industry? John, that's Mark? more for you. Yeah, I, I don't, <laughs> yeah, I'm not really a global uh, company in as far as uh, you know, we're staffing people company. So I think it's more for brick, it's bricks and mortars or, or John's got more diverse with his uh, watches uh, selling it, you know, yeah. Online, you got the whole world wide web. Yeah. So for me, I mean, you know, look, I, I came from a really traditional industry where, you know, you have brands that are hundred hundreds of years old. You have a model where, you know, look at Kay Cameron. Kay Cameron's got an amazing store in town. I, I could, I know her secrets of success too, but, but a lot of these stores, it's, it's, a, it's a very old industry with that is very resistant to any sort of change. And, Originally, you know, I love wristwatches. I like, I'm, I mean, I've got wristwatches tattooed on me, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about the craftsmanship of it and things like that. And, um, for years, my dream and, and would have been here in Sable is just to have a watch shop, you know, and carry some great watches and educate the community and, and host little, you know, gatherings of watch enthusiasts, things like that. And that was a dream of mine. And as I saw the world changing and the marketplace changing and things like that, I mean, I, 
the last few years that I was in traditional retail, I'd have a client come in and say, hey, I'm looking for this particular watch. It's sitting right in front of me in your showcase, but I can go online and get it for 35% off. Hmm. Meanwhile, my cost on it was 40% and we've got rent and this and that, and, you know, and it got to a point where I was like, this model will not work for my future. I'm not going to open a store and say, we'll put a million dollars of inventory, which I couldn't afford to begin with, put a million dollars of inventory in here and hope people come in and not get undercut by the industry, by the, by the internet. So when I was kind of game planning my whole, what am I going to do for my business? I fell in love with micro brands. I knew it was emerging market, but the beauty of it is you can't find most products that I sell anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, most of the brands I carry, I'm either the only authorized retailer in the world or at least the only one in the United States mm -hmm. for almost every brand I sell. Um, I have brands contact me weekly and say, hey, you know, we've got this brand. We know of your store. We would love to do business with you first thing I do is start poking around the internet and find out where they are and how much I can get a discount on them because I, that's not my game. You know, I, I thought about like when I started this, I'm like, well, I can't, I cannot compete with Amazon. It's just not going to happen. Right. So if I, they have far broader reach, they have better pricing. It's, you know, overnight delivery and all. I mean, so I had to actually actively look for products that I didn't have any competition. Hmm. Now, I do carry G-Shock, which a lot of people know. It's an inexpensive, very popular brand. But it's funny because the one, two, three hundred dollar G-Shocks that most people are aware of, I have them in inventory, and I don't think I sold maybe 10% of them since the day I started carrying them. What I do really sell well is the more expensive ones that most retailers are afraid to invest into because it might be a two thousand dollar G-Shock or a sixteen hundred dollar G-Shock. So then I buy those. And when they come in, I do a video on them. I put them out to the web. I'll do an email blast to thousands of people. And next thing you know, I sold 10, $1,700 G-Shocks. And people look at me and say, well, G-Shocks, a $150 watch. I'm like, well, I sold 10, $1,700 ones. I don't know how. So it's just about being, it's looking at the internet and saying, I don't want to compete with you. I want to be different in mm. my little space. Exactly. Yeah, it sounds exactly like Dan. Dan, you found a very specific thing, and Frank, to you too. Like yeah. you found like the riches are in the niches. And the, the one thing I definitely want to say about Frank's business too is that I shop at Stop and Shop two or three times a week. I'm one of those guys who goes in just because we need these four things instead of doing a big shop. I will never buy seafood there. I always go to his store because I value the quality. I, you, you know, the friendships, you know, the, the friendliness of the staff, but also I know that you're getting real seafood. Yeah, and I didn't use Whole Food. That was just like an example to help the conversation. I was just trying to make you look bad, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> can I can I tag something in here, Jimbo? Yeah, does, yeah, Mark, yeah. does Mark have something to say? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. So okay. you. Um, the word culture was coming up, and it was actually on some of my notes. I just jotted down a new culture. I jotted down on my notes, you know. And uh, you talk about. You know, the new economy that here's what I think comes out of this pandemic This is my big takeaway. All right. We have a new culture that comes out of this pandemic in terms of virtual communications and connectivity and the way we buy products. It's never going back to the old way completely. It's never going back to the old way for now on. Every time a company sets up a quarterly conference or a six-month conference or a yearly conference or a retirement party or something in the Bahamas or something as simple as an all-hands meeting, the virtual aspects, you know, oh, who's got the webcam? Who's got the, is there going to be a Facebook Live or what's the Zoom link? That used to be a secondary thing. That used to be like, oh, yeah, Jim down the hall does the virtual stuff. Maybe he'll be there. That's over. For now on, every significant event that occurs for most major companies will have a full, robust virtual presence, guaranteed, no matter what. And so from that, you will see all types of new software innovations and platforms. We're already seeing them coming to market. Mm -hmm. New ways to buy things, to take a picture with my face and deposit my check through the phone, right? And there's going to be a hundred different things. You talk about selling something brick and mortar versus selling something in person. And one of your questions, I'm sorry if I'm getting ahead. Oh, you know what, Dan? Let me put that up. Hold okay. On. One of your questions says consumers want to buy certain goods in person 
but then there's some people who like to have it curated like a shop owner for them. And so, you know, what is your advice to people starting businesses today? What I would say is, let me just tell you about one quick example that epitomizes my whole thing. Dollar Shave Club. In the old days, I used to go to CVS, walk in. I had to use the self-service checkout and pay $50 for four Gillette cartridges. And I felt abused when I left. Hmm. All right. Now, for exactly half the price from Dollar Shave Club shipped to my house, I get twice the number of razors and they're better a piece of chocolate, a comic book, a comic book with naughty, with naughty jokes in it, a beautiful blo a beautifully packaged box with gorgeous wrapper. You tell me what was the better experience for me as a consumer, going to CVS, getting the one cartridge thing and checking out through the self-checkout or getting that experience. So I was a little dramatic there, but the culture comes... <laughs> The culture coming out of this, in my opinion, is that Dollar Shave Club, the contact lens people, or the, the Stitch Fix, uh, you know, and all of these other people, uh, we, we, you're going to see a whole thing where the whole virtual offering is going to be as important as in person. And the people who win the marketplace will be the ones who can make it feel like in person completely virtually. Cool. Let me restate the question, and, and it's a little bit long, so I apologize for that. So, you know, there's certain goods you buy in person. Other goods, you know, there's just too many, too much variety. Uh, so you need a curator, like, an, like that selects pieces in the museum. So, I, and I, I think one of the challenges you know, for brick and mortar is, you know, we have high overhead. So your advice to people starting business today, what market conditions, and so Dan, you're, and I think Frank, you spoke to this too, is like, you know, what market conditions and ways of approaching business do you need to keep in mind if you're starting a business? And Frank, I think you said it, like it kind of gets at what Dan, Dan's point is, every day you're posting your goods. You got them up. So you're pushing out. I think, I think John said it best. I, I, I think um, the only thing that I would suggest to anybody starting a new business, to, it would be what John said, and it's finding something that right. sets yourself apart from everybody else. That is so powerful. That is the most impactful thing you can do. Let me tell you a little secret. Mm, I agree. When I opened Claude, I had never had a lobster roll before. <laughs> wow. Never. Wow. Not once. I still <laughs> haven't had our lobster roll. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of superstitious, call me crazy but I'm afraid if I actually have the lobster roll, we'll stop selling it. So I've had every piece of the lobster roll, but never the actual lobster roll. Not many people know that, by the way. Um, <laughs> but when, when we opened Claws, it was probably a week or two before we settled on the business, the, all the funds were transferred. And I told my wife, I said, listen, we're going to be poor for the next couple of years. I just want you to know that. But, we got to go away for the weekend. It's going to be our last hurrah for God knows how long. And I took her to Mohegan Sun. I like, I like to, to play craps, right? So I took her over there, and I ended up eating a lobster roll for the first time in my life. I've been doing this for 36 years. I've never <laughs> had a lobster roll before. I ate the lobster roll and said, I could do this. This could be something that we could sell, right, honey? And she said, sure, whatever. I don't care. It just turns out that that's our number one item, and that pretty much put us on the map. It was just something different. I've always seen lobster rolls, and lobster rolls is a you know an example, but lobster rolls are always made in a in a hot dog bun with lots of mayonnaise, and it's almost like a lobster salad, just loaded with mayonnaise and all kinds of stuff, and imitation lobster blended with regular lobster. I said, no, 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 no. The lobster roll I had in Mohegan Sun was actual lobster meat and it was a little bigger, you know? And I said, well, can, can, can I do something that is cost effective, somewhat profitable, and something that people are gonna go, holy crap, this is good, and fill them. Mm. Because a little tiny lobster roll and, 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 a, and a hot dog bun, to me, I could eat three of those, you know? But if I could give that in almost like a hero, for something that's affordable, 
uh, that could be a winner. And lo and behold, that, that I mean, that was our that was our boost that was much needed with a business just opening. So, like John said earlier, if 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 you're just going to go out and sell something that Amazon or that the guy next door is selling or the guy down the block is selling, my advice is don't. You're mm. probably going to lose everything. But if you can come up with something, if you can come up with something that's different, that's got that wow factor, that's different than everybody else, set aside everything else I, I, I sell currently. If I just sold lobster rolls in a hot dog bun, I would not be where I am right now. It's <laughs> got to be something that's different. And that's, that's, that's a testament to what John said right there. Yeah. Cool. So Mark and John, please elaborate. I'm excited. So uh, I have to just interject as far as a common thread here with all these entrepreneurs are they, they seem like they listen to their clients, you yeah. know, and, and that would be my piece of advice is um, like uh, find out what the pain points are of, of what you want to do of your clients and then try to figure it out. Like for me, going back to my earlier example, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about catering. I was a bartender. So I went to the caterers, uh, What's your problems? Oh, everyone's always you know late, late bartender. They wear the wrong uniforms. They they're they they're not clean cut. They're they always uh, you know some people have gripes and stuff like that. So I kind of you know re-engineered my company uh, on that on that simple premise to uh, to solve those those pain points and uh, fill uh, fill a need. You know, so that that would be my little piece of advice for someone starting out. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, the biggest thing for me personally is passion. Whatever you're doing, I don't care what your business is. You have to really, I don't mean like it. You have to be passionate so much that it's like people want to tell you to shut up because you can't shut up about it enough. Right? <laughs> um, you know, God forbid we're out and about somewhere I'm with my family or with my wife and somebody mentions the word watch. It's like, uh -oh. it, <laughs> I don't care who you are. I don't care where you come from, what your, what your thing is in life. If you want to talk about watches, you're done. I'll talk to you for hours. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a passion thing when people, you know, when people go home at night, a lot, a lot of guys are big sports guys. I'm a, I'm a big hockey guy, but I'm not, I don't go home to race home to watch a game. When I'm at home at night, sure. I have the TV on, I might have a movie or the news or my wife's got something on, but I'm actually sitting there either on my phone, my iPad, my MacBook or whatever. And I'm, I'm reading watch forums and watch the, and you know, I don't feel like I have a job. I don't feel like I have a, I don't feel like I go to work when I come here. You know, I, I dress the way I want to dress. I put music on, I'm answering emails. I'm, I'm shooting a video just because, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, I got this watch in today. I'm break it open. I'll do a live Instagram video and it's just for fun. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of cool because I knew nothing about what Dan does. I knew nothing. And, and Dan started coming to my office through a guy that works with me. And, and I've known Dan for a long time, but we kind of reconnected again. I get excited about Dan's business. We talk about, you know, the giveaways he does and the, and the clip was your and, idea. By the way, this uh, stuff, this stuff was all John's idea. But it, it really wasn't. It was it was the conversation we were having. It was, and I yeah, because we have I, a back and forth. I got energetic about what he was talking about. Well, I'm, and, you know, and it's just be passionate about what you're doing. I don't care what it is. I mean, you could tell when you walk into Claws that that they know their stuff. The the layout, and the, the what they select is you could tell there's passion behind it. You know, and uh, product. Those knowledge. are the people. Those are the people I buy from. Um, I'd rather I'd rather spend more money, you know, from people who are excited about what they're doing, and and particularly if they're small businesses and they raise their family, and you know, I, I get excited about that. It, it creates loyalty, and so I would say to anybody opening a business, I mean, aside from all the fantastic thing everybody said, is is just enjoy, love it, really, really passionately, deeply love it. Yeah, it's uh, kind of cliche. They'll say to you. Do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. And we've all heard that. I think <laughs> it's good when it's an accident. Yeah. I think it's good when it's an accident. John's working in a watch shop. He likes watches. Mark was looking, seeing some Greyhound buses coming up. And you, we stumble into these things and then we like them and then we do them and then it doesn't feel like work. I just wanted to add a quick comment, Jim. You know, I heard Frank earlier say he was nervous about posting his prices and products to the Facebook page. Yeah, yeah. 
right? And then I heard John say that he was anxious about something and he decided to be aggressively transparent about the cost of his watch. And then Mark was getting real about the people saying how much they hate people with stained outfits and they don't show up to work. And these seem things like dull and nitty gritty things, but all of us are fearful, I think. Entrepreneurs are all fearful of not having to be able to serve their customer at night. It does, it keeps me up at night. If I get a nasty review, a nasty email, it takes me two or three days to get over it. Mm. But I think that what Frank did was by saying, look, I don't care. My competitors, I guess they're going to see it. In order for me to serve my customers, the list and the pricing has to go on the Facebook, right? Mm. And if my competitors get a little edge on me, they're going to get it. But I'm going to be able to serve my customer better. So he did it anyway, and he won anyway, and he's crushing all his competitors anyway, right? But you had to be able to be vulnerable. You had to be able to put mm. yourself out there, and you had to be able to fail. Absolutely. That's what, that's, that's what you need to get into business. You got to be able to be vulnerable. You got to be able to be fragile to fail and to do it again and again and over and over until it works. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. You know, it's interesting. I think uh, two observations. One is there's a growing body of research in academic circles about vulnerability and leadership. And, and my suspicion is, I think that what, the reason why people that appeals to people is we live in a more and more manufactured reality. Um, and where Good there's point. contrived messages. Uh, but if there's a vulnerability, I think there's, like you called it, Dan, just now, aggressive transparency. Authenticity, servant yeah. leadership. Well, it's your personalized. It's authentic. It's, it's a human. And I think one, one other point I just wanted to make, and I want to you know, get into the questions from other people, is, uh, and it, it gets at the essence of, of any of the Zooms that, that we've done through the library with Jonathan is, you know, that, that collaboration, John and Dan, about getting each other excited, like that's how Sable is going to succeed, is that we can create a dynamic business culture, entrepreneurial culture, where there's a willingness to share and to learn and to excite each other, and to motivate each other. Sounds um, good to me. And I think for me is that like, I, I want our downtown to be the, my kids to walk to the same downtown and that Sable clock, I want it. You know, and that's our identity and that's our, so when I hear about that kind of collaboration the two of you have, it's exciting. You know, one thing, Mark, actually, you know, I think I, it's something I think about and, and I'm sorry I didn't kind of prep you, but it's a question and then again, it will kind of move uh, to, the, to the audience because I do, I'm sorry that we've gone so long. But Mark, one of the things that I, I've thought about that I haven't seen us do in downtown, but I know that you're exper experimenting with, and John, you mentioned it through these where you work spaces, like these shared retail spaces. I know that Mark, you've kind of started to like play with that where you have movable furniture. And Jonathan, I know Jen talks about it in the library. So, you know, like you're having adaptable workspaces because like, how do you handle the overhead of these brick and mortars? Like, well, you, you chip in, you have multiple people working in a space so you can manage the overhead or you offer a high end product for two months that you can get up through a brick and mortar where, you know, they load in the inventory and you're there for two months, you're out another merchants. in. those are things that I don't see us doing much in Sable. Um, but I think I know you're experimenting with Mark. So like with this movable. Yeah, that's you know. separate to how you service. I own a few buildings in Sable and one of the buildings, uh, 285 West Main, we gutted, uh, one section of the building and created a co-working space. So it's these little uh, brand new uh, with the uh, that with that nice gray color everyone likes and the and the vinyl uh, flooring and gray. Ergonomic. And, yes, and it's shared and for a little bit over five hundred dollars each ha uh, has a, a an office that flows into a, a conference room and uh, it's shared Wi-Fi and things like that and. It's just an open, nice space. And uh, thanks for bringing it up because we're actually looking to, to lease some more of it. So Good. Anyway. Well, I just feel Call like I, I, want, I want our brick and mortar. I want, you know, I want my kids to have that experience. So when I heard you were doing that in your local, you know, your own local businesses, it made me hopeful for, for the future. Right, so me, I want to go ahead, John. John. Want, let, me, let me jump in really quick on that. For, for the shared workspace, for, for, those, for anybody who's never utilize one it's not only is it fantastic because of the cost and the, you know the the you know, i know we're gonna go with this yeah you're right but the it is it is collaboration right viral incubator of ideas and help and you know 
we're all a handful of us are, are uh, friends with JP Galeris, right? A yep. local Sable guy. And he had friends come in from California. And at one point he, and you know, he doesn't work here, but he went, at one point he brought his friends from California here that he's doing work with. I think Dan stopped by and my friend Harrison stopped by, who's like a, a social media nut. And we, it felt like about 15 minutes we talked. We talked for five hours and we put so many things on the board for what they're doing with their business. Mm. Things that, and they're in a certain business, right? They're in a certain industry. So their heads are, they're, they're, you know, they have blinders on, that's their industry and they're fantastic at it. But coming, you know, to have four or five or six people who aren't in their industry start throwing out ideas. Well, if we were building that business, we, maybe you do this, maybe you do that, maybe you try. And what Mark's building there if you've got a handful of different, if he's got a handful of different tenants from different industries with different experiences and, you know, as an entrepreneur, that's probably the best place to start your business because you have the help and the collaboration and the ideas. And, um, you know, I just want, I wanted to, you know, bring that up because it really is, it, it can change your business. It could be fantastic. If I could Absolutely. just tag, if I could just tag on that, in project management they call that osmotic learning, and they always preach in project management that everybody should be under one roof in what's called a war room. There's no substitute for face-to-face -face conversations. I'm having a conversation with Jim Birch, but John is listening to Jim and Dan, and we didn't even know John was listening. John learned something that saved the company time and money, and he never even visually took place in the conversation you can only get that from having everybody under a roof that's why i love what mark's doing yeah i want to lease one of his places <laughs> i want a discount on it nice <laughs> i want a new watch uh, yeah me bro, too I'm i don't want no g-shock yeah, one of john's watches in there well, well barter dan space for a watch and then <laughs> then i'll do the project <laughs> management course. who needs money right we can right. both I'll throw in a seafood basket too. I'm the I'm there. Yeah, lobster rolls across the board. I'll I'll have no. Yeah, lobster, lobster rolls. I'll work for lobster rolls. <laughs> Me too. It's right across the street too. You can just run across the street and get. Hundred percent diagonally. Yeah. All right. So let's open it up. I we got a question uh, from uh, Professor Bernardo. Uh, the value of informal and formal future forecasting. Um, did you react proactive or re reactive? And you know, that, Professor Bernardo, if you want to. Nuance that question, feel free. Um, Jonathan, if we, I don't know if we, I got nuance it or just even explain it. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. I'm a student of, <laughs> so I understand it. But go ahead, Professor Bernardo, you want to? And we have unmuted Professor Bernardo. <laughs> okay. Uh, Richie Bernardo. Uh, I forgot what the question was. Give me one more time. Richie, you okay. said, what is the value of informal and formal future forecasting? Did you react or proactive? <laughs> Actually, I was watching for that when I was listening to everybody talk, and each of you was doing that. Each of you was absolutely futuring. It's my favorite word, and it's, it is what it sounds like. It's a gerund, it's a verb, it's a noun. Each of you was doing that, but uh, doing that because you were anticipating changes, and and then you were either re responding to them or moving away from them. Uh, uh, oh, I forgot the man's name. Uh, forgive me. Well, hey, Dan, when Dan said before there, but when when Dan said the issue of um, the virtual economy was never going, was not going away. It was, it was, it was a thing to stay that was, you know, obviously propelled by the COVID uh, pandemic, though probably was well overdue in lots of respects for that matter as well. When that, when, when that's true, it's there. And what you folks need have, have done is you, you all, each of you has a, had a preferred future. Some of you much more, very, all of you are very passionate about it for, for sure. Each of you had a preferred future that didn't match with the probables. Mm. So you know the probables were, mm. you know, but we're going to we're losing spaces on. Uh, That's what John was describing when he was talking about the big watch brands. It was it was a loser's gambit. So how was he really? going to go? How was he going to align his future with the with the outcome he wanted to see happen? Exactly. And so what you guys were doing was was all of you, each of you in your own way was was uh, futuring, was moving out and trying to redo what you do in order to match, get the probable future as close to the preferable future as you possibly could. So I answer my own question. <laughs> um, Joan, yes, please. You said you, you wanted to kind of engage a little bit and have some questions, please. Hi, Joan. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. 
I need to talk about this idea of harvesting, I think of like organs, harvesting people's emails. <laughs> Um, my situation is I'm a retired teacher. I own Wise Professional Development on Main Street. And um, as a teacher, I was a highly successful staff developer. <laughs> I was known in other districts. I was known in my district. So I started this business 2014, 2015 in anticipation for the time when I retired, it would be established and I would start this business. So it hasn't taken off how, in the way I anticipated, although I am in it for the long haul. But I do, I don't want to just spend time waiting for it to take off. I want to do something proactively. With the virus, I, I really was hit hard because my contacts were all through direct mailings to schools. And suddenly there was no one to mail a letter to. Hmm. And, you know, I bought Facebook advertising. And although I specified how I wanted those ads to go out, they did not, judging from the people who liked my posts and my information, these people are not teachers and they, it said they would be. So once I hear you guys talking about having this bank of emails that grow where you offer things, and I'm just laughing before because I've been a victim of that where, you know, I'm a teacher and even though I'm retired, I see something I love and I download it for free and suddenly I'm on that person's page and I'm watching their video and I'm buying their $5 thing. Yeah, so again, I totally love it. That. Love it. Um, I'm like, oh gosh, that's me on the wrong end of it. <laughs> Oh, but go to school on but go to school on that everything you click on and you put in your email address you should be recording oh look i got an email the next day and then three within three days i had an offer in front of me to for a webinar but i didn't mean to cut off the end of your question no the question just is how do i start compiling these people's emails like what's right. what's a good step so i know john is going to have probably the best answer because he's a email magnet all right <laughs> My uh, quick question: Who's your who's your target client? Like, who do you who who is the person that ultimately pays you? Is it uh, is it like me as a dad who's got children, or is it? It's staff development for teachers, and I think my big, biggest business obstacle is that even before the virus, everybody's into online learning, and I'm here to tell you, as a teacher and as a teacher coach. And I'm telling you that it is not the same as in-person teacher staff. It is. It is actually. Oh, it depends, I Dan. I'm, with, I'm, with, I'm, with I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm I, I'm Hold just, on. Let me bring I, up some interactive polls. Joan, let me respond to you while I still have the thought. Here's okay. my advice to you, and I feel great being able to be a guy giving advice. Um, number one, <laughs> those people that you solicited through direct marketing mails to the schools and those administrators, they hang out other places. And they probably all hang out together other places. It might be Instagram. It might be Facebook. It might be on the Starbucks website. Who knows? Your first job is to go and find those people that were active and customers. Don't let them get away from you. Do your research. It's called avatar analysis. Do your research on your ideal customer, your avatar. John asked you who you thought it was. You said, oh, no, it's not them. You know what? You probably don't even know who it is, just from my own experience. I thought I knew who my customer was until I talked to a 1,000 of them. So number one, go find out where those administrators are hanging out. If you can't mail them with that direct mail or find out where they are and go hang out there and do recon and find out what's going on. Do I have to get and, dressed up for this or can I do a virtual? No, virtual, I'm talking about, <laughs> on, I'm talking, they're, they're hanging out places well, online. Just like, you know. wear, wear a mask. That's number one. So find out where they're hanging out and then I think what John was hinting at, and I'll let him kick in, you start need to document and define who this customer is, understand them and their needs, and then start putting content out there towards them. Don't worry about how you're going to make money. Start feeding them with the content, getting them to react to it, and find out where they are. Okay, but I have a question. What about what I said made you think I don't know who my customer is? Because I think Just because nobody does. Yeah, but in my case, I can tell you from being a teacher, so mm -hmm. I'm a person that was you know, being marketed to in the past, they are the younger teachers because they race through their credits as quickly mm. as they can because they want to get to the highest salary. The steps. Yes. So for them, the easiest thing is online, online, online. Mm -hmm. That's not my thing. I can do it. It's not my passion. Mm. So yes, I can set this up and I can make it all virtual and I, I couldn't make money at it or not. 
but it's not my passion. And if, if that's the case, like you seem to enjoy this from your perspective, Dan, as far as pushing Yeah, out but a thousand, Joan, a thousand people had to say to me, Dan, I don't know what to do. Dan, I don't have any time. It, it took a thousand times for them to tell me. And what I'm saying to you is go out there and find out what the big ask is from your customer. I don't have time. I don't have money. I'm not happy. I don't love this person. I, I need to learn online. I need what You have to go and you have to do a deep inventory and find out what they need. And then if that intersects with your expertise, you're in business. Okay. And I think it does. I think, I think it will. I think I, I have a lot of questions because I'm not, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot I don't understand about what you're doing, but I, I think there are a couple of spots that I would definitely look at. I think LinkedIn is probably your, that's probably your, your chest of gold balloons. You know what I mean? Like, cause LinkedIn, basically almost anybody who's a professional Serious at some point, and I, LinkedIn is zero to my business. So like there are different platforms that I think are better for others. Yeah. But I think professionals, it's, but I think, yeah. Yeah. It is, is your, is your, ideal client on Long Island is, or are you going to do, I'm, I'm guessing it's uh, local, right? Like on Long Island. On Long Island. Um, but with the virus, because I was offering online courses, I advertised to New York state because I'm, I have a license with New York state to offer professional development. There are ways like if, it, and again, I don't know exactly. Like there are a lot of questions I have before I can give you specific answers, but for instance, let's say for instance, there's somebody within a school district that is your that your decision maker that's going to get training for these group yeah. of teachers or something. Right. Those decision makers are on LinkedIn. They have a specific title and a specific profile. You can through LinkedIn get so specific when you're targeting people to title location, you know, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And you could probably get a list somehow curate a list through LinkedIn of a very, very pointed potential client base mm -hmm. with that you could market to them in certain in many many different ways and i think dan is the pro at saying oh get putting the fish in the water the hook in the water right like but he's the guy who goes okay you offer this for free offer that for free have a little like a downloadable something PDF, or other pdf like a pdf what right like and if and tell them if, if they click on this link, they come to this page and they fill out their name, their position, their, the district they work for and so on and so forth. And once they do that, you're going to email them that PDF, whatever's valuable to them. Right. Yep, and maybe give them a 15 minute clarity call. Now you, now yeah. you have their email and that's, and that's gold. Where is that? Like, where do I put that thing on Man Facebook? Page. On my, I have a website. Well, put it on my yes, website. the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, okay. You, you put it on all of them. Let me, John, let me jump in here for a second because I, I have a doctorate in school administration and Professor Bernardo, if you want to jump in, he's retired assistant superintendent curriculum. Now, the person that's generally purchasing those types of services is an assistant superintendent of curriculum instruction. However, they're often getting ideas brought to them by teachers. So a teacher could see, wow, this is a particularly interesting area. And this is, I'm speaking specifically to, to Joan's product service, is that like Joan's offering something that a teacher's interested in, a teacher presents it to their assistant soup. So there's often an indirect relationship between who's paying for the contracted services. Um, but so you have kind of two audiences, you have the assistant superintendent, and there's like national curriculum associations. Not then, audiences, uh, leads, leads. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fuzzy relationship because both of them are technically consuming that service. One of them is authorized with the dollars. The other one, it's their needs. Yeah. Well, can I tag on what John said? What I would do is I'd do exactly what John would say. I'd get the whole list of the decision makers together. Then I would sign up for LinkedIn premium for 50 bucks. You get to send 50 private messages to anybody who's on LinkedIn in the world. I don't care if it's Bill Gates. And I did that. And I went to the top 10. I went to the top 20 people in them. Hi, I'm Dan Ryan. I'm trying to make a name for myself. Will you please take 15 minutes and let me call you? Half of them didn't even respond, but two or three of the biggest guys in the industry said, like, here's my cell phone number, call me tomorrow. And the next day I'm talking to the industry leader in my industry, like, hey man, can you help me out? Like I'm trying to get started here, right? And that's hustle. So that's what Joan needs to do. And John's right, she should go to LinkedIn, she should target a list, and she should start pinging those people and finding out what it takes to get through to them. Okay, yeah. that's, 
beautiful. Thanks, thanks. There, there are two groups of people. One is, you know, the individual teacher who needs credits for him or herself to advance their salary through courses. Another customer mm -hmm. could be the, you know, the supervisor in the school district, such as my home district of Brentwood, who would hire me to say, do the staff development, which I will was going to be doing this year, but it didn't happen. Next year will happen where I'm paid per day to go and work with their primary math staff. See so that this, now you have a suite of products already. Yes, yes, I do. I, you know, I do. you have one-on-one -on -one coaching, you have the administrative product, and you have the end, the teachers. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I think it's a wonderful thing, and I think that John was right. You should target that list and go for that. And, and, and then also, Joan, you should contact, the, there's 40 million people unemployed. You should contact the unemployment department. I've had people come to me where the state paid for all of their training for free. They applied through the unemployment department and right. all, of, all everything was paid for for them. You could probably get registered as a service provider through the state of New York and then that would be you. Huh. Oh, okay. John, we keep cutting you off, John. Did, did you... Uh... For me? Yeah. No, I look, I can go on about this stuff for hours. I mean... Um, you know, Joan, there's, there's got to be, I'm sure there's Facebook groups for the Brentwood Teachers Association and the, and the Central Isla yeah. and, the Sable and this and that. Get in those. Get in and, those. And find somebody you admire or a, yeah. a friend of me. Well, right? other, like I had somebody who I emulated in the industry. My ultimate goal is to take them down and surpass <laughs> them. But I went and I, I went and I did a forensic analysis of every single thing the guy had ever done in his whole life because I wanted to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> you have to find your mentor, Joan. Everybody has a mentor. Okay. Jim Jim Birch you had did. an amazing you doctor did. from Sable. <laughs> Jim Birch had an amazing doctor from Sable that I call my father-in-law, but everybody's different. <laughs> you know, the there's the one thing the one thing I've learned about going from like the big the big watch brands working with Rolex and, and all the big guys to this micro brand space is that in, in the big stuff, everybody was a competitor, right? Like don't buy this brand because that brand's better and so on. Everybody, there was nobody who worked together in that, in that side of the industry. In the micro brand side of the industry, I, I actually teach a course called Micro Brand University where we, we take budding brand owners and for two days and, and not virtual, in a live setting, sit with them and teach them everything there is that they need to know to get their brand from concept to success. And the thing that the big thing about all this stuff is that we everybody works together in that side of the industry right and there's a saying that i'm sure many of you heard that a rising tide raises all ships and i think that we can i think that we i think sable is good at that i think sable's an amazing community but i also think that we can make more of a concerted effort that no matter what part what business you're in what industry what service whatever it may be there's a lot of smart people around us and things that people that might look at things a little differently than we do, right? Like I, I look at my business and I think I know everything, but then all of a sudden Dan comes in from way outside of my industry, knows nothing about what I do and comes up with these brilliant ideas where I'm like, well, damn, that's good. Right. And who knows, maybe we should all think about getting together once a month as a problem solving thing. Maybe, maybe yeah. that's something that the Sable Chamber of Commerce does. I don't know. I've never gotten involved, which I really would like to. Um, I would too when I saw this. That's why I yeah, that's what Jim Birch was saying when he was talking about that our human capital, our, our Sable's IQ is our best asset. Yeah, and I think I think that would be fantastic. And the one the one offer I'll make to Joan or anybody else, if you ever want to talk about this stuff, call me. You know, call Dan. We're I mean, me too. I'm in. When when this whole lockdown thing is over and everybody's safe to get together let's get together at one of mark's uh, at mark's uh communal well, place <laughs> you know frank will bring frank will bring the food i'll buy, I'll buy the beers frank will bring the food i'll bring the hey, frank. Oh. hey frank how about doing a cooking class you know what it's coming yes it's coming. you see that you see that i love it and just it's, it's, many many moons ago food. probably <laughs> It's been on my plate for two years, and I was going to launch something maybe uh, about a month or two ago, and this whole thing just yeah. got me so crazy. I'm like, ah, I'm, I'm going to put it off until I, – I think I'm going to start it in the fall. You know, oh, but, I'm excited. But, uh, well, maybe after, not cooking, but how to shuck a oyster or a clam, you know, or how nice. to fillet a fish. Yeah, yeah. It, took, it took me – Gail, you've been chopped. 
Let me kind of. I, I, I can do to say something. To make a clam sauce, but Yummy. cutting up the salmon, I'm I'm afraid people might get cut. Yeah. But but just going back oh, to right, right. just you know the whole town and stuff. Jonathan, um, we did something uh, yeah. one, two, two or three two years three. ago at the library, and it was um, it was really great. I was with Kay Cameron, I was with the guys from American Cheese, it was me, and it was a couple other people, and we had a thing. It was just really a live panel. I thought it was it was absolutely awesome, and it was people that wanted to or were thinking about opening up a business. They would come down, and there was just a I think it was five or six or even eight of us, and they would just just throw questions at us and we would just give them their you know the answers i guess or just I remember that happening and, yes uh, I, I don't know if you guys have anything anything like that planned in the future but that was that was phenomenal that was that was a couple of years ago well if you want to talk about listening to your customers we can certainly do that oh, you got it i'll work on it i would i would love it i mean yeah. what what i what i found and with each of the workshops that i've done with james is when a community comes together, that's where you find your solutions. Absolutely. So, mm, amen I, to that. I didn't know what we would be walking into tonight. I just thought, I've got a whole community that is experiencing business headaches all over the place. Mm. You know, when I go to a chamber meeting, I see businesses sweating. I see businesses worried. So I was thrilled when I heard James come with, with this idea and then start to hear just little sound bites about what each of you were doing in your businesses. And that got me excited. And I thought, yes, I mean, this is exactly our business community needs to come together yeah. and talk about how they are adapting. Right. Because like you're at the front of the curve. There's a ton of businesses behind you that are struggling to hear it, the wisdom that you just provided. I've got a book of notes here. I think someone on the chat thread said there's an article in this meeting. There's an article waiting. Yeah, to definitely. So I would absolutely love, uh, I definitely want to stay in touch. I would absolutely love doing some spinoff programs. Yeah. Uh, businesses. And I mean, there's a slew of, of rabbit hole subjects we can go down mm. uh, just from this interaction and come up with some other programs. I would absolutely love that. Yeah, great. It suggests a different approach to business. That the, the the dynamic that you're talking about, including with that shared space and your own relationships with one another. Uh, I have a family member. He's a he's a bond trader. He's a very successful guy. Um, North Shore, Nassau County resident, but opened up a nice, really high end Italian restaurant in the Northport. Um, so you know, this guy's a you know brass knuckle. You know what I mean? Like he, my wife's cousin, he's mellow as he's gotten older, but he's used to this kind of cutthroat world. So I was talking to him. I said, you know, you're opening up your high-end Italian restaurant. You hired your chef from Italy. You got the North Fork table and in. Yeah, like, I'm sure like those guys are like, you got your site fixed on. He said, James, it's not like that in, in the culinary world. He said, we, you know, we, do we have a, a competitive relationship? Okay. But we have a collaborative relationship because you don't want to always go to the same restaurant all the time, but if someone's willing to take the drive out to the North Fork to go to that good restaurant, they'll be willing to take the drive out to go down the block to a different restaurant in that same community. Yeah. So I, I, I hopefully the kind of sharing and collaboration that we're seeing, it's what optimally what we're doing is we're modeling a way of business that's suited to the changing market conditions we're seeing in COVID, but that I think just exists. You know, we're not, do we compete with, with our competitors? Yes, but we learn from them. You know, Dan wants to take his down, but there's also a symbiotic relationship and a collaborative relationship. Meanwhile, think, to be honest, to be honest, the guy I'm talking about is one of my major business partners. Yeah, I knew that. But I think, and that's the way when you play a team sport, you, you often have a competitive relationship with your teammates because you realize right. that pushes each other. But I think you support each other. So you compete but you collaborate. So I think for me is, you know, with John, we are, I have immense faith in our community. You know, I, I look at each of you as business owners and I think like, um, I see what you're doing and you're innovating. I think we're going to come out the other end of COVID. I think we're going to be fine. I think we just have to approach it from the standpoint of how do I take care of my customer? How do I learn? Um, and then how do we move forward from there? But there's like, not everybody's had questions. Uh, Dana, Gail, you know, 
Feel Jim, free. Jim, Dana put a question and she asks, is there any advice on how else to network in the community while we're still social distancing? She understands that the use of social media is there, but she's wondering if any other virtual sources might be helpful during this time frame. So, so what do you think? I mean, everybody like that question is, you know, there's social distancing, but what other virtual sources can help you? Um, so, well, Dana, feel free. I mean, I mean, like personally, I like to collect coins. I'm a member of like six different Facebook coin groups and the guys are putting pictures and videos of the cool coins and we got com camaraderie. So that's, so first thing is Facebook groups. There are a gazillion of them. Yeah. They're free. You can, too. Even, you can even set your own up. Go set up your own private fa Facebook group, Joan, and, and, and make a private Facebook group for that service you want to get started and make it invite only and start inviting some of those uh, administrators you find from LinkedIn. Okay. Um, but yeah, you go on so go on the Facebook groups. They're very helpful. Try to look for webinar. Well, here we are, but there's other people doing this is amazing and there's other people doing this you know, go and look on, go and look and try to join others. I don't know. That's all I got, I guess. Okay. Right. Uh, that was so good. The networking events, um, you know, maybe Meetup would host a networking event for professionals. And so I'm, I don't know where else to find that right now while we're not meeting in person. Mm. So if there's any other ideas that come up, that would be great advice. What for. industry are you in? Um, I am a life coach. I just oh. left retail. Okay, so I put my email in the chat. I know some good life coaching websites. Why don't you ping me? All right, thank you. Yeah, I mean, Dan, as Dan said, the, the Facebook groups are phenomenal. They, I mean, whatever your interest is, I don't care if it's, you know, uh, cornhole or, uh, you know, spaceships. It doesn't matter. There's a Facebook group that, that or, or many of them, for that matter, that kind of fit into what you're interested in. Um, you know, search all different sorts. And wait a then, minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Harrison, the guy who sits in I your just, office, is in, a, is in a massive networking group. What's the name of that? Uh, he's in like four of them, uh, Latip and a few others. But I was Latip. just going to mention that. It's like, you know, Harrison works out of my office. He works in, the, uh, in, in my office. And there are times like I come in and I say, hey, Harry, I'm going to be on, I'm going to be on the Zoom call tonight from seven to nine or whatever it may be. And, you know, he knows not to walk through my screen while we're doing that and vice versa. But what I hear from him often, very often is, hey, I'm doing a virtual happy hour with a networking group or I'm, I'm doing a virtual, uh, you know, um, panel with a different networking group. All these networking groups are still just like many of us, they, they're figuring out a way to keep continue doing what they're doing. Mm. Instead of doing it at a 7 a.m. diner meeting, they're doing it through Zoom. Yeah. Um, so you can actually yeah. look up. I would look up Long Island networking groups or, you know, just do a bunch of searches like that. Mm. Go to their website and touch base and say, hey, are you guys doing anything virtually until, you know, whatever phase opens up that we're all allowed to get together? I mean, there's probably a handful of things that you can find where it's, it's just like this. You jump on and people introduce each other and say what they do and try to pass business along and things like that. Cool. But Facebook groups is, is probably one of the, one of the best places. You got to spend find. time. You could get a lot of junk and garbage. You're going to have to join a few, find the one you like, you'll wind up quitting the ones that are no good. And then you'll, you know, you'll have find ones that you like. Hey, Frank, what about you? Do you have a private Facebook group for Claws? Or do you have a Facebook group or just the public page? I just have the public page. Um, I, I, I was thinking about her question also, and, and, and it, it really all, all boils down to Facebook because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge gun guy. I love you know, collecting commemorative guns and older, older guns, and I've, I'm, I'm in so many groups and uh, I love I love kayaking and and I'm in a I probably twelve groups for just bass fishing and kayaking alone and I can't even imagine uh, the number of people that I would total in all those groups. Um, you know, life coaching. You would need to to, to eat healthy and uh, you know health food groups and th th you know things of that nature. It's it's really all about Facebook right now. I, can, I, I, can I can I just be a Debbie Downer on that for one second, please? Yeah, Frank, <laughs> what happens? What happens if Mark Zuckerberg starts charging a hundred dollars a month for Facebook next month? Then what happens oh, to your business? I'm on. I'm in. 
What about all the thousands of customers that you have through it that won't pay it? Okay. All I'm saying is I'm playing devil's advocate. Don't hitch your whole wagon. If you're starting off now, do not hitch your whole wagon around Facebook. You will be at the, your business will be at the mercy of Mark Zuckerberg. My biggest online social forum is in a private website that I created and I can do anything I want. Anytime I want, nobody can tell me anything. Well, my, well, that's, my two that's cents. A good point. That's a good point. I, I mean, really the, my only crutch right now is with Facebook through the pandemic. Well, you're crushing it with their ads on your zip code advertising. You're crushing the well, local area, right? I, and I'm paying for that. Though. Yeah, a lot of money. I'm... Oh, yeah. All right. So any any other questions we didn't get to in terms of the audience? And if if not, then, you know, we can, you know, we'll close out if you guys have final words of wisdom. And then the way we always kind of do our final wrap up is Jonathan closes out, but audience, any other questions you didn't get a chance to ask? All right. So any words of wisdom, like the one takeaway, Mark, Dan, Frank, John, you, a, per, a pearl of wisdom you want to leave people with? Uh, ne never, never give up. Just keep on keeping on. It's never, ever yeah, good. unfortunately, at this time, only cliches come in because they're true. <laughs> you gotta they're go. True. You gotta go there. You gotta All right, go. you are never gonna work a day in your life if you're doing what you love. Failure is just success is just failure turned inside out. Yeah. But so John, Frank, anything? And again, I don't. I just don't want you to leave this and say, "Oh, darn it! I wish I would have said that." No, I, I. I I think everybody has learned a lot over the last couple of months. For me, I, I, I've learned a tremendous amount, not only in my own business, but personally as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think if there was any positives that would come out of this would be groups like this and events like this. And, a lot and, of positives, and, yeah. Um, um, you know, just just take life one day at a time and, and you know, enjoy it. Um, you know, I think I think a lot of uh, a lot of folks out there, and I'm sure everyone here can agree. Um, I think we kind of lost sight of just the importance of life mm. for many many years, and this this whole pandemic thing just kind of hit home. You know, it it uh, for me it made it made me and my family eat dinner every night together as a family more often. Number two, it uh, made me appreciate my business and my customers more. Uh, it made me listen to, to you know to my customers and my family more. Um, mm. Made me eat healthier. Made me exercise regularly. Uh, it got me off of my ass because I was getting lazy myself, and I had to work every day for God God knows how many hours. So um, I, I would I would only advise everybody just keep just keep the course, and and you know hopefully this thing goes away soon. I don't think it will go away permanently. I don't think life as we knew it would you know come back anytime soon but uh just um you know steer the course and and live life happy you know because there's a lot of craziness out there right now yeah 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 i wise agree words wise words frank thank you i agree i mean oh uh the only question i have are we sharing our emails on this um on the chat sure or is there... okay yeah sure you're more than welcome to thank you there is a button on the, uh, if you click on the chat button on the bottom of your screen, uh, the chat window will, should open up on the right hand side of your screen. At the very bottom, you will see an icon on the lower right with three dots. If you click on that icon in the chat box on the lower right with the three dots, uh, you will see an option for save chat. Wow, look at that. And your computer <laughs> will, will make a file for this chat. So while you've all been talking, I've been saving. Nice. So, uh, keep that up. Uh, that is I've so cool. I have to that. use that more often. Little tips and tricks, you know, as we as we trip and fall our way through Zoom and uh, that environment, we, we're finding good things. So that's a little nugget right there. Cool. Well, and that's the thing. It's like John, Jonathan's a library media trained person. So the, that information management, I that's get it. Right. And, you know, the thing is, if, if, if anyone in our group, um, you know, I think uh, my I think it's my mom's mom who had a phrase that said, you know what, if you have a tongue in your mouth, you are never lost. Mm. And so, you know, I think everyone might feel a bit siloed in this experience. Everybody feels like they're going through the
this drastic learning curve alone. And quite honestly, you are not lost. Uh, we live in community. We're communal beings. Ask your community. And we've just done that tonight. And I cannot believe the amount of wisdom that I've gleaned. And you know, uh -huh. I'm just a librarian. I'm not a business owner. But I'm getting nuggets of wisdom from all of you and you know, taking notes feverishly all along. So I can only suggest that to you. Um, I am here. Uh, my email address is in the chat thread. You are never lost if you have, if you have a tongue in your mouth. Ask me. And I'll help network uh, and, uh, and get you connected with folks in the community who can help. Uh, just like, you know, thank God uh, James uh, and I have connected through this. And I cannot tell you the wealth of wisdom and the amount of ideas uh, I've gotten from, uh, from James and the amount of ideas well, he well, continually I has. So... Just I can only say on behalf of the library, thank you to all of our business owners uh, who've uh, participated tonight, oh. uh, Frank, Mark, Dan, John, and James, uh, and then all of our folks who have chatted in uh, with your ideas, don't, uh, with your business ideas, don't get discouraged, stay the course. You know, you're doing your tough work now because you're going through the, probably one of the toughest phases of your business. So you're doing your hard work now. You're getting hard, getting started is the hardest part. Yeah. yeah, Jonathan, I wanted to thank you and I wanted to thank Jim Birch. This has been amazing. And any way I can support Save a Library or Save a, please let me know. Thank you for having yeah, me. Absolutely, Dan. Likewise. You got it. Thank you. Just uh, I want to say this before we close out, and uh, you know, I want to give everyone a chance to say goodbye. But one thing just to remember is the next two Wednesdays at seven, we're going to have interviews. Right. Uh, I mentioned before Eileen Tisner is this Wednesday at seven. Next Wednesday is actually Nicole Fuente, she's the editor for Suffolk County News and our locals. Um, one thing that's, it's a little further in the horizon, but it's good, I think it'll be interesting is um, June 24th, right. we're gonna dig into opening. It's gonna be a legislative and medical panel. Um, so I'm bringing in people that, for example, you know, I have elected officials that are gonna participate, but I, I think we need, I want one around the curve. So we have people like, I have Jamie Atkins, who works for Community Ambulance. Um, they do a lot of, you know, emergency response to illness, COVID related, but a little further, uh, one of the women is a, she's a professor, um, works at Stony Brook. She's in charge of the paramedics education program, because I think we need to understand the model for opening. Uh, and as much as Cuomo has done a lot of sharing of information, I don't know that people really understand the model and the phases on a local level. I think Cuomo speaks on a state level. We need more specificity to understand how to work within that, that's going to be June 24th. And that, you know, that'll be well advertised. But like, guys, I, I can't begin to tell you how impressed I am with each of you, um, what we've learned, what you shared, what you're doing, you know, for your families, for our community, uh, the wisdom you have that you just put out there and shared with people. I, I, I'm indebted to each of you and I appreciate it. Uh, any last thoughts, uh, you know, to close out? And then, Jonathan, again, you, you, you closed out great. I just wanted to mention those future events. Absolutely. Uh, please watch for that publicity for the June 24th event. Uh, you'll be seeing that come out from the library soon. And we've got your emails now. So <laughs> we got that. <laughs> Email harvesting. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, really thank you everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks. You too, everybody. Take it easy. Thank, Thank you. you Stay safe. Stay safe.